Hi everyone, this is Galeb and you're watching me live on my YouTube channel. Today is 26th of September 2021. We are going to discuss a lot of matters at hand and we are also going to talk about different questions and topics that you guys have in your mind. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel, I'll suggest you to subscribe and also press the bell icon to enable notifications for uh, this channel. and and you can also support me on Patreon. The link to Patreon is in the description. So we are going to start with Prime Minister Imran Khan and what he has said about Taliban and what he's saying right now. So Afghan girls school ban would be un-Islamic, Pakistan Prime Minister says. So what does Mr. Khan say here? Let's have a look. The women are very strong. You know, I let feel me know if give there is them no time word. and they will assert their rights. How, uh, much, how much time? Years? A year, two years, three years. At the three moment, years. But at the moment, uh, uh, John, it's just too early to say anything because it's just ba barely been a month after 20 years of uh, civil war, they have come back into power. Our biggest worry is that this will be a, a huge humanitarian crisis and that would immediately lead to a refugee problem. Uh, secondly, if uh, they do not have an inclusive government and gradually it descends into a civil war, which, will, which if they do not include all the factions, sooner or later they will, you know, uh, they will have again um, a, a, a sort of a civil war. That too will impact Pakistan. It, be, it will mean an unstable, a chaotic Afghanistan, ideal place for terrorists, because if there's no control or if there's fighting going on, and that is our worry. So uh, in, uh, terrorism from Afghan soil, and secondly, uh, if there's a humanitarian crisis or a civil war, a refugee uh, uh, issue for us. So Imran Khan thinks that Taliban not letting the girls go to school is un-Islamic. But if we talk about it with any mullah, any mullah that uh, is in Pakistan even, the mullahs like Mulana Abdul Aziz, he would say that girls can only go to madrasas and they can only get Islamic education. The school education or the Western education is not for Muslim girls and this is what they teach. So it's a prevalent mindset uh, in Pakistan and Afghanistan that girls should not be educated. And this mindset that I'm talking to is the mullah mindset that they have. So mullahs have always preached that only Islamic education should be given to children and no one should get the uh, the secular education, even it is not secular in Pakistan or also Afghanistan. It is, it is Islamic education there also because there are subjects of Islamic studies that in Pakistan, Imran Khan has now made them compulsory from the first class till the PhD. So the PhD scholars who would be doing PhD and they have to do research and research is, you know, not an easy thing to do. And it requires a lot of time and, and PhD scholars or even the people at master's level or even at the bachelor's level cannot be bothered with some useless Islamic education. So Imran Khan himself has made it compulsory. So anyone doing a PhD in any Pakistan university would also read Quran and Islamic, uh, Islamic studies. And it's going to be like that. So the children who are in first and second standard now they are being exposed to karis in, in the schools even. These karis are notorious. They are child abusers. So now these people will get, get jobs in regular schools as well. There are already Islamic studies teachers. But now, you know, these people will be in universities, will be in colleges. And, and as soon as there is an Islamic studies teacher, uh, he starts moral policing of the students. They start to suggest to the woman to cover up and they tell the students they cannot intermingle with the students of opposite sex and all kind of prohibition and all kinds of 
problems start to originate with these mullahs wherever they go they destroy institutions so if there is a teacher who is a mullah type of uh, professor in a university he destroys everything even bahawalpur medical there was a hospital in bahawalpur which recently issued a circular to all the female staff that they would not cover they would they would be covered they would not expose their hair and they would be properly covered in hijab and all of that and apparently that medical director that was appointed in bahawalpur hospital that was a mullah kind of a doctor so he imposed this and the mullah doctor would not be educated from a madrasa he would be indoctrinated due to his own will or maybe uh, whichever he would be an extremist he was an extremist but what happened is that uh, if these people can bring such kind of islamic uh, bigotry and dogmatism and uh, gender inequality into hospitals so that would also be brought into universities as well so on the one hand imran khan is criticizing taliban for not letting the girls go to school and on the other hand he is he is doing the same in his own in his own uh, country where now the phd scholars would also be required to study islamiyat in the university so it's just too horrible so here it is we have now the first the first doctor who confessed that he had done an abortion in texas has been sued now so and now this thing can start to go forward so san antonio doctor who wrote a washington post claiming that he had violated texas 6 v abortion ban now faces at least two lawsuits brought against him under the ban both brought by the plaintiffs who say they oppose the new law so any man any person can now uh, sue the doctor and this doctor has been sued by two people one lawsuit was filed monday by the oscar stilly a former tax attorney in arkansas who is serving a home confinement sentence for a federal conviction on tax crime so this tax criminal is under house confinement and he is filing this case against this doctor who had performed an abortion so the uh, anywhere in the world where when you involve religion with politics so what starts to happen is that criminals start to use these laws these religiously motivated laws it happened in pakistan in 2017 when the justice shokat aziz sadiqi who was uh, who had several corruption cases uh, you know running against him in the courts and he his case was pending in the supreme judicial council he started this uh, uh, this rant against the online blasphemy and he called uh, you know director general of fia and then he called the uh, then home minister uh, the Chaudhry Nisar Ali Khan and even he called Pakistani uh, Prime Minister uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, at that time to his court and he said that online there is a lot of blasphemy happening and you should take uh, charge you should arrest the people who are doing it and then there was a lot of pressure on on the people who were uh, on criticizing or discussing religion not even criticizing just dis- discussing religion so this is what is happening here as well so this already corrupt corrupt guy who is here for tax crimes booked for tax crimes already he is filing this lawsuit he filed a lawsuit against the phys- physician dr alan braid in baxter county in a phone interview with cnn stanley said he is an opponent of law that bars most abortions in the state but wants to clear the way for a judge to rule on its this on its constituency so so this stilly said that he is an opponent of the law that bars so he is against the abortion against this but he is doing it i am a supporter of the constitution i am opposed to the law stilly said so a second lawsuit has been filed against braid and philip and gomez an illinois resident who describes himself as a pro choice plaintiff in the suit and this might be happening this thing uh, is that 
uh, now people will make a lot of cases against in because there is a thing going on that they should flood the courts with this kind of cases that the courts just stop accepting this these kinds of cases so nancy northrup president of center of reproductive rights the organiz- organization legally representing braid said her client had been called to challenge the legality of the law because the alternatives for his patients are untenable and that the law is creating havoc in the reproductive health care in texas so basically uh, the the gynecologists know that well, how much problems these things creates create and what kind of things happen so uh, it seems like both of these men who is one of them who is already on the tax crime uh, arrested for tax crimes he is uh, what you are saying he is also against the uh, this uh, this anti abortion law and these two cases have been filed and let's see what happens it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens because in usa the, the fight between the right and the left is you know very uh, vibrant and both sides try to exchange blows once in a while and and this texas abortion law is one of those things which have been happening so uh, then there was another thing that happened in texas so you know the red state the apparently christian state is kind of a hot bed for all this propaganda that goes on against the vaccination even so here is this maybe this couple it was last week when natalie wester and her husband went to hang time a bar and restaurant in rallet with a few friends something they say as new parents they don't do often so if you've ever been new parents and whatnot having those couple of hours out like once a month or so is so important for your mental health. They're fully vaccinated, but say they choose to mask up when out to protect their immune compromised four month old. But once inside, our waitress came over, sat down next to me and said, so our manager sent us over because I am nicer than he is. And yes, this is very political, but you need to take your mask off. No masks allowed. It's a policy you don't hear often during the pandemic, but the owner says he considers it part of the dress code. I spent my money on this business. I put my blood, sweat, and tears in this business. And I don't want any masks in here. He says it's a private business and he has every right to refuse service to those who want to wear their mask. I feel the overall reaction with the mask is ridiculous in the United States right now. There's no sign. Instead, the hostess tells everyone who wears one they must take them off at the door. So when they put their mask on the other night, they were reminded that they were asked at the front to take it off and they didn't want to, so we asked them to leave. He says he was unaware of her immune-compromised son, but that it's a rule they will continue to enforce. So this is how bad it is in USA where uh these people who are uh, kind of on on the right side of the political ideology they There's think that wearing masks in your area is that... something that should not be done and that is that is something that that is wrong because these people they had a child who is sick who whose immune system is not working properly they don't want to take the virus home and they don't want to you know uh, kill their baby because apparently if this baby whose immune system is not properly working who has an uh, immune uh, what you would say disability the he would be at a lot of risk because of covid and these parents when they were wearing masks inside the restaurant and and definitely they would take those masks off when they had to eat but this owner who was who's whose assistant who a waitress even told them that it is very political and i am nicer nicer than my uh, manager so you have to take off the mask and when they did not they told them to leave so it's not only people who are coming into different restaurants and supermarkets and everywhere where they are being asked to wear masks and they are not wearing them but it's also the opposite if someone wears a mask at such a place Where, who, whose owner seems to be uh, you know a very politically charged he would tell people to go uh, go and leave that place so all these anti vaxxers and if we ask this manager 
Uh, I don't know if he would be vaccinated himself or not. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised even if he was not vaccinated because there are a lot of people who don't want to get vaccinated and they are politically motivated, they are religiously motivated, and this is the this is the problem that everyone in the world is facing right now. There was a protest in Australia against the lockdowns and they, apparently it was told that it was the construction workers that th were doing that, but when the police profiled the people who were doing this, um, and this, uh, this protest, and uh, they were and causing this unrest. So most of them were not from the construction business at all. So they were just the people who were maybe politically charged or maybe religiously charged who wanted to just not, you know, they did not want those lockdowns. So basically, wearing masks or getting vaccinated is not just to protect yourself it is to protect others as well there there are sick people in every household in every neighborhood and those people definitely require a lot of help from the healthy people who can survive if they get covid but there are a lot of people who would not survive if they get a covid infection so it would be really really difficult for them to survive and and we are seeing people losing their lives this way so a couple of days back i was talking to a friend and his mother had died because she refused to get vaccinated in pakistan and and the the father got vaccinated and the father got sinopharm not pfizer or astrazeneca or moderna no they got sinopharm the chinese vaccine the father got the chinese vaccine and he is still alive he did not get covid and i am i am i am learning it from everyone uh, in pakistan that anyone who gets vaccinated even with the chinese vaccine is surviving no one so far has been told to have died of covid who had gotten vaccinated and i till now don't even know a person who would have suffered a lot who suffered a lot even getting you know the first dose of vaccination so uh, if you get both the doses, you are in a pretty safe spot. But even if you get the first dose, you still are very safe against the this deadly disease. Amit, thank you for your super chat, Amit. Uh, Amit is, has been always a very good support. And yeah, so uh, let's move on. So climate change is kind of a reality that we most of the times don't even realize that it is happening. And as the ice is melting, what is happening is that there are some microorganisms that were trapped in ice and a 24,000 year uh, old microorganism that was in, trapped in the Antarctic ice just came back to life. So we don't know that if plenty of this ice melts and gets into the into the sea so what kind of micro microorganisms will be released that are trapped in that ice and what effect they would have on the on the ecology of our planet right now so so a trip to the to a melting glacier will shape how the bbc's new climate editor justin rowald reports on the full story so what is here I was surprised how moved I was, but I'd seen in weeks it took to travel home. I tried to process my emotions. So this is how bad it is. The ice is kind of melting and many places where there was a lot of ice, uh, there is no ice anymore. And soon it would be a lot of problems. So I don't know if I've shared the audio or not. We've decided to make an igloo. We'll need to put one brick in on the second layer and then prop that. Yeah, I think this is not the article that I was actually talking about. That was another one. I'll, I'll try to find it later and show it to you guys. So, yeah. So now, uh, Taliban, what they've done is that 
all the people who they released from the prison, the Taliban that were released from the prison, now they are in charge of the prison. So Afghans, Afghanistan inside the prison staffed by former inmates released by the Taliban. So this is the video where these Taliban who were who were the people who were uh, controlling, who were inmates in the same prison are now running the prison. So this is how it is. The footage shows Taliban surrounding the full Cherki. Yeah. So they also release the people from Islamic State also. This was harsh imprisonment. Places full of cockroaches, pretty filthy. They left, you can see, in a hurry. All their possessions. There's even still laundry on the lines that they've set up here to, uh, to dry things. When the gates opened, these guys just ran for it. So when the gates so just opened, all of these the people were just released. Taliban cell block. And you can see they tried to make themselves fairly comfortable. It was obviously very cold in the winter. And these spaces had to be rented from the authorities for, you know, quite a lot of money. You're talking about $100 or something like that. Uh, the Taliban in this place, I've been talking to some of the guys here who are former inmates, uh, ran their own affairs. They try to keep. So they had a Taliban gang Sometimes going on in they the say the prison. prison authorities brought in criminals or people with big drug addictions, and they say that they tried to talk them out of it. Uh, there was also uh, a lot of heroin for sale within the prison, and a great deal of corruption as well. So now these guys are running the prison rather than being who were inmates earlier and now running the prison. have inflicted savage violence on civilians as well as men in uniform. There is a long history of guerrilla and insurgent movements strengthening their ties as a unit during long spells of imprisonment, giving them a stronger identity, perhaps as well, a stronger will to win. And that, I suspect, is what was happening here. So this is happening right now in Afghanistan, that the Taliban who were in the prison, who were inmates, now they are running the prison. So this is how it's going now. So one other thing that they did yesterday was they issued a day before yesterday they issued a statement that they were going to punish the people uh, in in all the brutal ways that Islam prescribes. So now they have started to hang the bodies of people who they have killed around the cities. So some kidnappers were. Uh, arrested and when they were found guilty, I don't know through which system they were found guilty. Were they uh, on trial in front of a judge or something like that? Or it was a say, Sharia court, whatever it was. So what they did was they just hung these people and their bodies are still hanging at the uh, squares in different cities. So this is what they are doing. The Taliban say that they shot dead four alleged killer kidnappers and hung their bodies in public squares in Afghan city of Herat. So in Herat, they hung their bodies in a public square. So this is what is happening. Uh, the, the, the news of chopping off of hands is also coming out and maybe there have been some beheadings as well. And we don't know how it is going to be, uh, but we already have a lot of idea how the, what they're doing and how they are going to, uh, how things are going to turn out when we talk about human rights. They just shot these people and they were just alleged of uh, uh, kidnapping someone and they were i don't know if there was a trial or because in this article when i read there is nothing 
about a trial that happened there so it's it's brutal and the same things are going to be repeated which were there and this is how it is so yeah Okay, I'll give you guys the link and we are going to slowly start talking to you. So I will be here for three hours. So there are a, uh, a few spots there in the uh, studio. So you guys can come and talk to me. Hi. Hi, how are you? Can you unmute yourself? Golden Age Islam. Hello. Hey, Khaleb. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Yeah. I'm uh, nice. Nice. Thank you. So okay, first so, time here on the English channel for me. So thanks yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. starting. Yeah. Okay. So what do you have? Okay. So uh, I just thought you know um, since since I joined very recently, I didn't know what the what the topic of today is. If you, but I had. There's uh, no particular topic. So okay. if you have anything on your mind, you know you. Yeah, can... yeah. So I thought you know maybe yeah. a little bit of uh, information uh, to share yeah. on some of the uh, Islamic things. So. Um, one concept I wanted to put forward that mostly people uh, are not aware of, uh, and especially people who convert to Islam or when you are uh, when you are talking to people who do the dai work, like say they they propagate and they preach. So some of the concepts related to there, and uh, it also kind of affects. Let's say you when you start to raise questions about Islam. Uh, what are the things that people leverage in order to, to so it's related to the concept of takia basically mm -hmm. uh, and i just thought that you know we should talk a little bit so people mo know more that how uh, let's say apologists from time to time and other people all muslims use that to propagate what they want and how seemingly at least to me it's against the the moral 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 compass sometimes mm -hmm. okay so <clears throat> yeah so i think um, a lot of people are aware with what is called takia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, takia. I think this, we will talk about how, for example, this this is intellectual dishonesty. I think so. Takia is one thing which means that in Islam you can hide your beliefs, right? Yeah. Uh, let's say in a life-threatening situation. Now, and uh, but Shia, Shia, the Ahle Tashayyoh folks, they really in the Shia fiqh. This is uh, justified and they normally practice it. Whereas in Sunni Islam, the, the practice is very Less for takia at least. Mm -hmm. uh, the the clear cut uh, meaning of takia is that okay, if your life is in some kind of a danger, you can say okay that I'm not a Muslim or not disclose your identity in such a way. Okay, so this part is fine. But what people do not know most of the time that there are two more levels to it. Uh, one is called kitman, and kitman. one is called toria. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's very important for everybody to understand what that means. Itman uh, is something which is meant, which is called lying by omission, and these two things uh, are very practiced very normally and casually, and you know by by tons by all Sunni Muslims also, especially when it comes to preachers. And I'll give you some examples on how that mm -hmm. can affect. So kitman mean literally literally means uh, that you can lie by omission in order to protect a greater cause. Now, on mm -hmm. one hand, you know, we are taught that, you know, Islam is teaching us to be to be truthful, yeah, truthful people but, and, you yeah. know, uh, be honest and, you know, give your head even in, in the in the name of, let's say, religion and stay upright in terms of your morals. But Kitman, what does lying by omission mean, for example? Uh, like so they can say, choose. Yeah. They can choose for the sake of, they can choose to lie for the sake of Islam. Yes. So let's say you can easily choose. Now, and now, now exactly, you kind of summarized it beautifully. But. A lot of people listening would say, okay, what is the proof? So let me tell you a simple example, how you can check that this is a ongoing practice. So mm -hmm. a lot of people would be aware with, let's say, Tablik Ijmaat, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, in Pakistan yeah. or in India, in Bangladesh. What they do is they carry a book. Uh, it's a Fazail-e Yeah, um, Fazail it, is very it is a collection of books, which is uh, very different from uh, Hadith books, like like Saha Sitka and stuff. Oh. I would like anybody go and ask, for example, uh, people from the league, hey, why do you use this book? I mean, this contains stories that are mostly fabricated and, you know, because they are actually like that. It was collected by a guy called Ilya, somebody who, who established the Tablighi Jamaat. And it mm -hmm. doesn't have strong stories or any authentic narrations. The 
So what they will tell you, especially the senior people, if you go and ask them if you're friends with them, they'll tell that, hey, you know, uh, in fiqh, it is allowed to lie if the greater purpose is to serve Islam. So you can basically literally come up with stories and narrations if they portray a positive image of Islam and they could be completely fake. Yeah. And that is the reason they will put it forward to you. So this is from where, this is the concept behind the, the, all those ahadiths where this, you know, old ladies used to throw garbage on the Prophet whenever he used to pass by. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is behind and they can even invent fake hadith yes. according to this kind of mentality. Yes, yes. Yeah. So they do it. So the idea is whenever you get in, engaged into a debate with, let's say, a preacher or let's say people, any of these, even to Muslims, let alone non-Muslims, they don't even know this. But even to Muslims, as everybody knows, Tablighi Jamaat is something which is very, very rampant in Pakistan. And, you know, if you live there, you come across them and they come to your house and you go with them. You have, Everybody, almost everybody has friends, somehow some connections to that. The Let's talk about a little about Tawriya which is even mm -hmm. more uh, dangerous actually and it is allowed by fiqh actually in, in shafi fiqh there <laughs> i mean there's yeah. some books i mean they've they talk about a little bit about how to even practice it now what does toria mean toria means is to intentionally create false impressions by me by 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 saying statements which are vague and which could lead the the listener into like he doesn't get what you're trying to say so for example uh let's say uh, let's say I come to you, uh, I come to your house and say, you know, uh, something like, I don't know. Um, let's say I ask that somebody is, is somebody present in your house and you say, uh, no, for you just say no, meaning you, 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 you don't, you don't give any more information. You give a vague answer, but you know that the person is present, but no, when I hear the no, I might think, Hey, okay, somebody is not at home, but you, but maybe saying, you know, no, the person is not in the house. They're on top of the house. So, yeah. so you can project such kind of thing. So this is called Toria. So for example, uh, yeah. So now combine Kitman and Toria, two things together. What this hmm. means is that whenever a greater purpose, now the, the, the requirement is of a greater purpose. Now what is a greater purpose? That is a very, again, just like vague definitions within within our fake. This means anytime when, you know, the, the propagation or betterment of Islam or improving the image is required, you can do both these things, which means lying and omission, lying by omission and giving false impressions is absolutely justified. And books even go to the length of explaining how to do it. Yeah, because they are doing it. And even the Shias, they yeah. have a justification that uh, for all kind of taqiyya, that uh, all of this was being practiced by Hazrat Ali during the yeah. Khilafat of the three earlier, uh, you know, caliphs. Yeah. So this is what the Shias believe and, and, and the concept might sound very Shia, the Takiya concept, but it is practiced by everyone. Yeah. The mullahs, they know about it and they do yeah. it all the time. Yeah. Even so, when a mullah rapes a child, yeah. when all the other mullahs protect him, mm. behind that is the same notion that they are lying for the greater good. Yes. That this, this alam deen or the preacher has yes. done so much good for Islam that one such thing should be ignored. Yes. And it should be lied about. And this is how, yes. how they can hide any kind of filth behind yes. behind the now, mirage of protecting Islam from the you know from its opposers. Yeah. So one one thing I think we should keep just a little bit of distinction between Takya and these other two Kidman and Tauria. Takya is specifically to save your life. And I know Azrat Ali is said to have done that because his life was at danger. Yeah. And so, so you can, in some certain situations, you can, you can justify that. Yeah. That, hey, you know, if, because if your life, if I tell you, hey, you know, you know, tell me whether you are something, whether you're Muslim or not, or I'll kill you, for example. Right. Yeah. So you might say, okay, fine. Uh, into some moral justification. Uh, but when it comes to the other two categories of Kitman and Tauria, I mean, they are literally saying you can intentionally... Yeah false give false impressions to uh, for the greater good so you could tell wrong stories and this is what happens i mean if you look at that book fazail amal it is full of utterly false stories no no connection it's just like stories of people and when you ask them they say no it's okay to concoct fake stories if it gives a positive message yeah yeah so they they give the entire spin that just like you know it's it's like a piece of advice like a fake but 
but mm-hmm. pieces of advice are not attributed to there no no characters like that you you can you cannot justify that by that so yeah mm-hmm. i just wanted to you know uh, bring this thing um, some people know this some people know i think it's a, it's a matter of uh, knowledge i think everybody should know what these things mean and how they are actually practiced all the time to deceive people mm-hmm. yeah this is how it is anything else you have um i mean i i didn't have anything specifically on my mind but if you want to Talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Then I'll I'll move yeah. on. Then. Okay. Thank you. Thank See you. Sure. Bye. Okay. So yeah. So there are a lot of spaces in the studio. So if anyone wasn't able to talk yesterday, you can come and talk today. So humanist is there. Hello. Okay. Amit is saying, please support rational movement by supporting Galib Bhai. Please like and share the video. Patreon membership is also open. Please check. the videos description for more details thank you thank you amit yeah hi hi how are you hi sir hi uh, yesterday i think i came on the stream urdu stream uh, but uh-huh. my mic wasn't my mic wasn't enough for uh-huh. to speak i'm not having i'm not comfortable in Engli- english but i will try uh, uh-huh. yesterday I, i was trying to say about the uh, engineer, engineer mirza he mm-hmm. recently uploaded i think on his own uh, uh, main channel or some other he has some other small channels on. so he mm-hmm. uploaded uh, and he is very proudly saying that look how allah uh, sometime uh, bring the uh, verses upon suggestion of uh, umar radhi allah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i uh, when you when irrational people listen they, they must be laughing but yeah yeah they the way they are portraying the, this thing i i can imagine now how i have been i have been like uh, uh, miss 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 you miss being misused by these kind of things and these kind of stories for the whole of the my life because when they put some tadka of small other things side by side so then they just cover up the things and deceive the yeah people so in that video uh, engineer was saying that that uh, umar said that it was god who caused him to demand such and such was yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah, how god. absurd it is that Uh, that umar knew better than the prophet and the god no. to no. ask for such and such a verse and those verses were revealed and there are at least three verses that were revealed according to the wishes of umar one of them was where these people used to go to the prophet's house and they wouldn't they would just sit there and the prophet would get uncomfortable and uh, and he would not tell those people to go so mm-hmm. then he said that and then the wife beating verse was also uh recommendation of uh, umar khattab so uh, and then there is that hadith also that if someone would have been a prophet after me that would only be umar so that's mm-hmm. also a sahih hadith a mutawatir hadith in both bukhari and muslim so you can see that it was a whole team that was creating islam it was not just the prophet it was mm-hmm. the whole team and some of them truly got the credit for the verses of islam was uh, verses of quran as well so we know that there were some ex christians and ex jews who were very close to the prophet like zaid bin sabit who compiled the quran later on kaab bin ashraf was also there then then there was uh, there was a christian slave that prophet muhammad had a lot of friendship with and and he used to walk with the prophet in the streets of medina and then there was salman farsi who was a former christian and all of these people were very close to the prophet and and all of the others were like uh, uh, like abu bakr umar uh, the zaid bin sabit ali usman usman uh, atm machine yeah yeah and uh, salman farsi all of these people these 20 25 people were all of them were katabina wahi or the scribes of wahi and uh, their poll like their their secret was just let out by uh, abdullah bin saad bin abi sara who was a convert to islam he converted to islam after the hijra 
and uh, when he came to Mecca, he was a learned man. So the Prophet appointed him as a scribe of the Wahi. And then what happened was that when the Prophet was, was reciting some, some ayats that were the verses of Quran that were just, just revealed, and this guy, when because all of that is poetry actually. So the first first sentence of sentence of the uh, uh, of the ayah was said by the prophet. And Zad bin uh, sorry Saad bin Abi Sara he completed the second part. And the prophet said, yes, yes, this is how it was revealed. Write it down. So he wrote it down, and then he realized that the prophet was creating the verses. They were not being revealed. And he then tested the prophet. He was, he changed the verses of Quran and he would suggest changes to the prophet. Like if the prophet would say that, write this and or that, he would write something else. And then he would tell the prophet, I wrote it like this. And the prophet would say, oh, it's all the same. Don't worry. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then he, he ran away from Medina and he went back to Mecca and he went and told the Quraysh, okay, this guy just makes up Quran. There is no revelation. There is no one bringing the revelation. And so, so kindly repeat yeah. this person's name. I always forget. <laughs> Abdullah bin Saad bin Abi Sira. I made a video, the first ex-Muslim. It is on this channel. You would be able to find it. And it's sir, when, and sir, when uh, after the conquer of Makkah, he, he was presented in front of the Prophet. Yeah, then yeah. He, so, he wanted yeah, yeah, to yeah. wanted to get yeah, I, I i heard it about you and i'll i verified it and the later on which i uh, get from other uh, islamic scholars like information like videos that he ended up as a governor because there yeah, were yeah. stakes there were stakes in the time of usman he was a governor governor i mean, think he was a governor he, in egypt or maybe somewhere what happened was abdullah bin saad bin abisra when he ran back and he apostatized and he told the people that Prophet Muhammad was just creating the verses. So uh, then the Prophet Muhammad, when he conquered Makkah, huh. so he ordered six people to be killed. And one of those people was this uh, Saad bin Abi Sarah. So he was a cousin of Usman bin Affan, the third caliph and the ATM machine, you know. So yeah. what happened was that Usman hid him in his in his own house in Mecca. So what happened is then when the Prophet was there and he conquered and everyone was like, you know, subjugated and Usman brought him and just stood him up in front of the Prophet. And he said, uh, Rasulullah, please accept his bath. Mm. So the Prophet turned like towards his right. He did not look at Saad bin Abi Sarah. So then he, Usman came to the right side and said, Rasulullah, please accept his bath. So he turned towards the left. And from there, Usman also came to the other side and he said, please accept his path. So he came to the third third time. And after the third time, the uh, uh, then, you know, Saad bin Abisara did the bath and his path was accepted. So what happened later on was that when Usman and his cousin were gone from there, the Prophet told the Prophet was angry and he asked the Sahaba, like, why didn't you kill this man? I'd ordered you to kill this man. So why didn't one of you stand up and just chopped off his head? So they said, we were waiting for you to give us a sign uh, with your eye. And he would, he said that it is not, uh, you know, uh, it is not the uh, habit of the prophet to, uh, you know, give signs with his eyes. So uh, in this way, Saad bin Abi Sarah's bath was accepted. He was accepted as a Muslim and he lived a very long and healthy life. And in the end, he was, you know, he was, he became a governor also in the time of Usman bin Affan. So this is how it was. So Prophet was always kind of dependent upon these very close Habis, all the four caliphs, Khulfa Rashidin. He was heavily dependent upon them. Even Abu Sufyan later on became very important. Then uh, the son of Abu Jahl, Akrama, became very important. Then, you know... Uh, uh, what you say his name was Safullah. I am getting his name now. So Khalid bin Walid, all of these people, Ali Umayya also became very important because you know it was a war business and all the soldiers were needed and and these soldiers provided a lot of uh, you know brilliant service to the Prophet and they helped him propagate the 
a word and they helped him uh, you know spread the empire and made them and uh, they made him establish his power so these were very important people yeah uh, and one other thing that muslim uh, whenever someone convert in then uh, they always want or it is very like compulsory for them they think that changing their name they 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 must have to change their name so i always ask them what was the name of khalid bin walid before the accepting the quran the accepting the islam so everyone even everyone has the beard so mm-hmm. why these uh, these are being more faithful than the actual <laughs> stakes yeah 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 all everyone was, had a beard at that time everyone had the same name rasulullah never yeah. changed anyone's name after even everything from the islam. yeah the names were all of these pagan names were just welcome mm-hmm. to be had in islam so no problem at all yeah but now nowadays the if some other is yeah accepting islam some way, they have to change yeah. their name yeah. and they think that the, this is very <laughs> Why did Muhammad not change his name after accepting after becoming a prophet? Muhammad was also a a pagan name. But Khalid bin Walid Khalid bin Walid yeah. too much and lastly he is the guy who lastly I think accepted very lately. Yeah he 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 accepted Islam very late but he was one of the very you know dependable people who who knew how to run the affairs of war and he was heavily relied upon by all the three caliphs all the caliphs i wouldn't say that even during ali's time he was any weak all of them were but they they he was like he was totally dependable he he won them a lot of wars and a lot of victories came through khalid bin walid yeah okay and- Uh, okay. just one point if if there uh-huh. is a time uh uh madi how how do you uh, in, in as per your knowledge or i listen a lot on your channel ibn maryam then i i, I conclude that madina madina's people may have accepted this group this mm-hmm. rebels because maybe they were suppressed from the jewish because jewish was always uh yani having wealth and everything uh, uh no it was not the jews that were suppressing them they were fighting in between between them but, but there was they were both both enemies of each other there must be uh, equality between them so maybe they wanted to overcome to them it, it could no, be no 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 the jews were there were two jewish tribes both of them were aligned with all of the jews tribes the two big jews jews tribes were aligned with the two different they basically jews were their vassals the jews mm-hmm. used to give them some money and also provide help in war but the number of jews living in medina was very you know it was not significant as compared to the ansar of medina no 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 they were very before before these rebels came from the makkah to medina hijrat no, madina still 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 even before that the jews were mm-hmm. not that many oh there were seven tribes but they were not very big mm-hmm. so the biggest tribe like uh, banu quraiza was only 1600 people that's that's all so all the jews combined would be maybe 5000 people even less than that so banu quraiza and another tribe banu nazar they were the biggest tribes both of them but the others what... were even smaller than them what could be ma- what could be there are major reasons that how the uh, these ansar people accepted and embedded these people and like how how what what could be there like uh, benefit according to the islamic history there was some unrest in medina and the mm-hmm. people of medina wanted muhammad to be the arbitrator between all of these people and they wanted him to make peace in medina which he did in a way mm-hmm. not for the jews but from for everyone else he did make peace in medina yeah yeah okay okay, okay thank you then i'll thank see you, you then thank bye bye thank you okay julia blister is there hello hello can you unmute your mic hello okay i think he is not around so 
Salvador Dali is there. Hello. 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 Hi. 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 How are you? I'm good. Ghalib, just one second. Can you hold for one second, please? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Ghalib, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Ghalib, I was thinking about today discussing about... Uh, about like on the dark matter and dark energy what do you mm -hmm. think is like you know like we've been we've been like scientists have been thinking about it for so long what do you think is uh do you think could be the possible scenarios or a few scenarios you think that could help us solve this uh, mystery we know that there is dark matter and there is dark energy we yeah. know that yeah much. And, and we have clear-cut evidence that there is something. Because if we see how fast the, the, the Milky Way is rotating, especially the outer arms of Milky Way, yeah. and uh, uh, objects that are rotating at such high speeds cannot be uh, held together by the amount of mass that is there. And you can see it in Milky Way galaxy. And that mass includes everything, gas, asteroids, meteoroids, all the space rocks, the planets, the gas giants, the stars, the neutron stars, the white dwarfs, the brown dwarfs, the black holes, everything. So the mass yeah. is not enough for the stars on the outer arms of the Milky Way because they are rotating at such huge speeds. So on those speeds, if let's say, uh those at those speeds the those stars would never be able to stay connected to the center of our galaxy or to our galaxy at all because there is not enough mass to exert that much gravitational force to keep these stars that are on the outer arms of our galaxy in place and keep them rotating with the so they would be ejected from the galaxy if there was no dark matter so so when they calculated one thing that came to our attention was that how much more mass do we need in our galaxy to hold these stars together? So but, but the I, I initial estimate was at least we need 40 times more mass. 40 times yeah. more mass. Yeah. But that mass is not there. So what is what is the mass? And Throughout the last 60, 70 years, we have made a lot of progress in that. We have made maps of different clusters of galaxies, groups of galaxies. And we know that there is dark matter. And this dark matter is not only confined to the galaxy or the center of galaxies. It also exists in between the space, the space in between the large clusters of galaxies. It exists between the, between the galaxies as well. So we don't know what it is. Maybe it's some new particle that is there that does not interact with the baryonic matter. Baryonic matter means the matter that is made up of, you know, uh, proton, neutrons, electrons, all of these. Yeah. So maybe it does not interact with that matter, but it gravitationally does interact with that. But there is another theory that has been proposed as well. And I wouldn't say that I understand that theory, how that works. And I, I, to be very frank, I haven't read much about it. So there is this, there is the standard model that says that there should be dark matter. And in some ways it perfectly works, but in some other ways, it cannot explain what we observe throughout the cosmos. So there is another theory there as well that is known as modified gravity. So in some ways, it explains better how the how the the dark matter behaves. Or they say that there is no dark matter, but on much larger scales, universe the the gravity behaves. Maybe it it gets amplified, or maybe it behaves differently. So we don't know. So that modified gravity concept tries to explain <clears throat> both dark matter and dark energy. So dark matter is what holds together the galaxies or the large clusters of galaxies. But dark energy is the thing that is pulling the universe apart. So like uh, all the galaxies that are part of our local group of galaxies that are almost 25 to 30 galaxies here 
and different clusters of stars. So all of these are connected by dark matter, but our cluster is not connected to other clusters. And the space in between the large clusters of galaxies is governed by all these large voids there where there are hardly any stars or gas or other material. The dark energy tends to reside there. And we don't know like what dark energy is. There was an experiment that has been confirmed a few days back. And the scientists are thinking maybe they have discovered dark energy, but there this uh, this experiment yet uh, needs to be, you know, uh, properly analyzed because during the last 50, 60 years, there have been certain instances where we thought that we have discovered dark matter or dark energy, but it proved itself to be a fluke and we did not get anything. So we would need some confirmatory evidence before we where was be this, able to where find. was this experiment done where was this it was in done? us it was in us uh, i i read about it but uh, you know uh, there are there is a lot of complex things was that it done are involved in... and i i don't i don't think that i am able to talk about it right now i i would need to study myself more about that experiment and then i would be able to tell you then, no just one question was it done at the fermi lab fermi lab no it was it was not the fermi lab it was somewhere else in us okay. it was yeah in, in the US. So, so do you think like, do you think like, for example, dark matter, dark energy, it's even part of us as example, like any mass has some sort of like dark energy associated with it? Maybe dark discover. energy is flowing know. through us right now. But you know, as we know that dark energy, even if it is a, a fundamental particle, quantum particle, but we know that both of them does not do not interact a lot with the with, you know, with the with the normal baryonic matter. And we are composed of baryonic. So, 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 so neither does mesons. Got it? Yeah, do yeah, do but mesons. but mesons are not. They are not dark matter or dark energy. Yeah, but so they don't maybe it is energy. also a particle because it rarely. They are also particles, but it's because they rarely or maybe not at all interact with the normal matters. So it's definitely very difficult to, you know. Because without for detection, we need interaction. And if they interact and very, very real, rarely interact, so this means that they are very difficult to find. And if they do not interact at all, maybe we would need some special kind of method through which we would be able to interact with those particles. Maybe we would be able to observe them somehow in the Large Hadron Collider because we try to recreate the situation that was there at the beginning of the universe. So maybe. Some way we would be able to do that, but till now we don't know how to do that. Do you think? Do you think the way we understand physics may need, may need to be altered to discover it? Maybe in a way. Yeah, but or... but you know that would be uh, something that I am not qualified to tell right now, or I wouldn't be able to uh, qualified to tell you like what we would require because you know we, it would require the best minds. In the world to tell uh, give us an answer to that so uh, i am in the dark as much as everyone else maybe some scientists yeah. have ideas but i don't know anything about it like how we would be able to discover it or what is what are the different uh, directions that scientists are taking right now to discover dark matter and dark energy so you know mm -hmm. yeah okay understood okay. thanks Khalid. I was saying okay. like okay. okay, thank you. See you around. Okay, bye that's bye. all I have for today. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Okay, Dilip is there. Hello. Hi, hi, Galeb. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I, I'm good. Uh, so, couple things. I'll talk about couple things. Uh, and uh, I have a question. My second part is a question, like always. So, first thing about the debate. Um, so I have to apologize to Harris, actually, not to you. When I was on your uh, a week ago, whenever the debate was, and I hadn't obviously heard the debate, right? I came on Sunday to your show. I was like, you know, Harris is a little bit soft kind of guy. Uh, and I was basing that based on his debate with Hamza like a year ago or whatever. But man, I heard this debate. And he was so good, right? I, I just think he was very, very good. Uh, I didn't find any problems with the debate. In fact, I think uh, the, the topics were so that Harris could 
could believed in his topic and the other guy believed in his topic right so so from that perspective it was fair you could make an argument that oh the debate was in favor of harris but that's from his perspective right so i thought the debate was very fair i only heard an hour and a half of it and i i was struggling to find any logic in the other guy's statement right i couldn't even continue yeah, same here same here absolutely same with me also i did, i watched the whole debate and i did not find anything that any argument that this guy made you know even remotely plausible or remotely convincing i i mean this thing about bastwana right i heard about no. oh there's a country called bastwana and and who is saying that if you just have some kind of democracy and that's all that's needed nobody said that right like there's so many yeah. other factors right so that is just one thing one base a very good base but you you you're saying oh things are not going well in bastwana uh, and he's mm -hmm. like oh the the, uh, the middle eastern countries have a lot of income he forgot about the oil income they get and which is mm -hmm. by the way you know i i drive a tesla and i'm telling you in the next in the next uh, 10 15 20 years the value of oil is going down right so so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know just just talking about oh yeah the electric cars have made so much progress now i recently bought it and i'm just amazed at the car right like i i sometimes think like why didn't we invent this earlier but obviously all in yeah, yeah, have their time because you know because the electric cars were there in the 1910s and 20s mm -hmm. in us at least mm -hmm. and no one no one tried to make them because usa had a lot of oil and they didn't want it to waste it so it was a easier thing to you know run everything on oil at that time no one con was concerned even about the global warming and anything yeah basically yeah. electric cars are a better you know technology yeah. they are more dependable they require hardly any maintenance you know now you are driving a tesla you would you would know it better than us it it hardly requires any maintenance you would only oh, need to change your tires nothing else oh man and the car is so good uh, you know you plug it in you you never go to a gas station you plug it in into your garage and even if you live in an apartment right you can just plug it in take it to a supercharger or whatever you just plug it in it is good to go for a week uh, uh, you know depending on how much you drive obviously every day but you know it, it it is so good uh, no no noise no pollution i know that electricity you know to produce electricity today we 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 burn coal and all but those problems can be gotten over in fact i would make an argument if this world was very peaceful really peaceful uh, free from religion and we all work together and we uh, harvested nuclear fuel like really it yeah, is yeah. it you know but the problem with that is obviously the lot of nuclear can be you know but you uh, know i am very excited about nuclear as well yeah yeah because because these small modular nuclear reactors you know uh, uh, bill gates is investing into it uh, uh, then uh, elon musk has also invested into it jeff bezos has invested into it these small modular nuclear reactors mm -hmm. are coming into business and they are going to if they are going to use uranium at first but their design is in such a way that a meltdown cannot happen hmm so i have been watching a lot of youtube videos and uh, i've read a few articles about it as well the main problem that we are facing right now is there is so much negativity that surrounds the nuclear uh, mm -hmm. nuclear power right now mm -hmm. but the modular modular smaller nuclear reactors are going to solve that and these reactors are made in such a way that you just install them once and they require a recharge after 30 years so mm. you can imagine like and and they are they wouldn't be able and if you make the thorium reactors thorium would have even you know a much uh, rarer uh, uh, what you would say risk of uh, meltdown the current nuclear reactors the very huge ones that we uh, that we are using right now all of them are based on the technology that us invented for their nuclear submarines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so a land based nuclear reactor that uh, that now is being proposed and many of them have been developed they are literally you know they you would just put them somewhere and they require no maintenance and it would just go forward and every week now we are hearing something about fusion technology 
So if if let's say we hit the pay dirt on fusion, I don't think so. We would require anything at all in the future. Even solar wouldn't be required. We don't require solar even mm -hmm. because solar is like a very. It takes a lot of space. It takes a lot of materials, uh, work, and it requires a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you get you know if you if, if you say see that time is spent and. Uh, and they are not very efficient. the 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 highest efficiency uh, solar panels are maybe fifty percent, not even fifty percent, I think. Mm -hmm. And so a nuclear, I think nuclear is the energy of the future. We have to just understand how to do it safely, and it can be done safely. And uh, there are other alternatives as well. We can do thorium. We can if if we get fusion. Fusion is you know. Fusion, yeah, the RS Gill, I'm talking about the ones that are gold based and they are uh, installed in the space. So the, those are, I think, 50 or 60 percent somewhere and they are too expensive. So I think nuclear is the, the technology of the future. And if we want to go to, you know, let's say we want to go to Pluto, we need a nuclear engine. Yeah, we yeah. need nuclear technology and mm -hmm. uh, an, an engine that would take energy. And we can even if we have fusion we can harvest hydrogen from anywhere in the space even so mm -hmm. it's it's just it it's going to be just magical if if we get fusion yeah fusion you know, is combining the fusing the hydrogen uh, atoms so my my son has been uh, trying to convince me this for a year or two on 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 the walks you know since we said that nuclear is the and i i keep telling him no but but it's just too risky. But I, I didn't know about the newer uh, newer stuff going on. Yeah, so you should, there is a lot of work. Even uh, I think uh, if we talk about thorium, India is leading, leading the way right now. Hmm. So the thorium-based reactors, I think the first country to develop them, but US has also invested in, in mm -hmm. the research that is going on in India about the thorium reactors. So, uh, you know, it's it's going to be a very exciting time if we get a fusion and or we get the thorium reactors. Those thorium reactors are much more uh, what you would say. Uh, uh, we are much closer to them. I think in 10 years we would have thorium reactors and thorium reactors would be, you know, there would be a game changer. They would give us a window between, you know, uh, between all these renew renewables that we are trying right now and uh, fusion once mm. there is fusion everything will become obsolete no one would want to have a have a what you would say uh, oh, yeah. uh, a solar park or a windmill no one would like want yeah to i have mean it, it it's it's interesting right like uh, uh, you know i think with the carbon emission and all if we could come up with a way uh, to to uh, to produce energy in a low uh, polluting way forget the cost but even the low polluting way that is the only way to really sustain so many people on earth right because everybody yeah, i think yeah. but but my opinion would always be that we need to reduce our population i think oh, we should go back to we should go back to maybe 3 or 4 billion yeah. uh, in in the next 100 or so years I because think, it's not about uh, only energy, yeah. right? So that is a diff what you're talking about. I'm 100% agreeing with you. So it's not only about energy. Yes, everybody has a carbon footprint, but it's also about space. It's also about yeah. quality of life. It's there's so so population reduction, right? That that is so important. I guess if people if if we solve that one problem, I mean, I I think like the pressure on the land to produce more food, water. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there's just so many, right? One can keep going on and on. Uh, just a water problem, right? Like, we, it's so much better. Uh, okay, big cities might have a lot of water. US might have a lot of water. But go into smaller cities in various countries, and it's a big water problem, right? So, so it only gets worse. Um, okay, so I have a second. I have a question for you. Okay, so this is again come out of our debate on a walk. So. Um, mm -hmm. I, I said I'll, I'll ask Galib because I told him that, you know, I, I know someone who's uh, really like atheist like us, but really has a very good grasp on history. And, you know, my, my, my journey to atheism was guided by some of some of your talks about how all these religions came about and all right so that really helps me i know a, a different point of views up, appeal to different people, right, some for some just proving something written in a book 
uh, is is uh, and proving it wrong appeals more to them, right? For other people, mm -hmm. oh, how did it come up? For some other people, some scientific fact, right? So everybody comes from a different angle. Uh, the history and science appeal more to me. So I was talking, so again, right, my son is taking a AP class on world history and he's studying that period uh, of, of uh, you know, of uh, when, uh, like from about uh, 500 to 1500, uh, uh, you know, AD, right? Like what, what happened and all that. And he's just started. So maybe he doesn't know much. He's also a very, uh, he's also a debater. So he's very argumentative type. So being a 16 year old, very argumentative. And sometimes I get tired of it too, right? So just, just <laughs> it, he's not all good. It's a typical mm -hmm. 16 year old, right? Like, so, but we both got stuck on a point. So my point to him was, See, uh, you know, if 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 there were no religions and all, then I think we could have progressed more. And I think at one point the Eastern world was a little more progressive. And then like the Islamic religion, especially, and I'm sure this is true for Hinduism too, they impose their own like, oh, we are not going to progress, right? Because the moment we start progressing and we start studying and the scientific progress is by way of education, then we will usurp um, you know, the religion, because why do you need religion? So th there was a lot of that, right? So he doesn't agree with me. He says that there was a lot of infighting. He says, what you're saying is kind of true, but there, actually the the reason the whole East, the Asian side didn't progress as much uh, is there was a lot of infighting. And he, he explained to me by infighting, he means, um, like he goes, the English and the French used to fight too, but they used to fight external, right? The English would fight the French and and they would both progress, right? Because when you fight, you have to innovate, right? To fight better, right? Like you 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 have to do that. But in in the Islamic world and all, there was a lot of infighting. And I know that is kind of true for the Indian region because there was no India, let's be honest, right? There was all these little kingdoms and they used to fight among each other. There may be a king who might have conquered a lot, but I don't know much about the Islamic history. Like, was there a lot of infighting that uh, like a fight among families for, for uh, you know, to, to get up that, that resulted in a lack of progress? W what is your opinion on that? So that was my question. I think the Western progress can be summed up into very different thing. Maybe things. Maybe you. Uh, this this would be uh, sound some things strange to you. The East was better than the West at first mm -hmm. because uh, it was much more difficult to survive in the West because of the cold, cold and yeah. you know mm -hmm. everything there. Mm -hmm. The West East was much warmer. And the West did not have that much means to come here and conquer us. And, you know, they were in a very tough survival kind of condition. So the, the natural selection was going on there. So that intelligent people would, would be able to survive better in the West than they would be able to here in the East. And innovation in a way why I think if you have a look at the world, so the colder areas have always been much more innovative. Mm -hmm. If you talk about the parts of China, which were very cold, South Korea, North Korea, North Korea was also advanced in the past, you know, before the communist communism came in. Japan was very, you know, cold there. There is, uh, you know, and these people have to innovate. These people have to keep their houses warm. They have to, you know, develop chimneys and all of those things. So it was happening there. But when it comes down to the next phase, when the West got a little better and the East also got a little better, so what was the dividing factor? When Islam came in and Islam controlled some of the parts of the world, and even if you see China, so the even the Han Chinese emperors used to have a lot of wives. And when Islam came, they also used to have a lot of wives. And even in, in India, the emperors and the kings and everyone used to had a lot of wives. Mm -hmm. So whenever the king would die, there would be a fight between his sons and different other competitors or the wannabe kings. And the, every king that died would bring a lot of unrest. Mm -hmm. It was, was there in the Islamic world. It was everywhere. So in a way, Christianity was one religion that brought something that was much better. And that one thing was, uh, you know, no to polygamy. Mm. 
and i think the earlier success of rome was also because of this that though they used to had concubines but the legitimate heirs to the throne would only be those who were born of a wife so in the west this idea of the 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 descendants or the rightful kings or the people who should rule after a king dies was very clear cut and no one supported the other one of these kings there so you know now especially the when islam came it brought a lot of destruction and unrest and progress was because even in the past the continuation of policies of a king mattered a lot if no one would continue his policy in the future so he would uh, no one would be able to you know uh, the progress would be lost so let's talk about if we talk about the british the british had a very and the monarchy was set the church was involved the choosing of new king was uh, the next in line was whoever it was though it be the eldest son or the eldest daughter they would get uh, in in the later years later centuries even the daughters would get uh, you know the crown and uh, and this was a, a very important thing uh, which was there and the succession when it was established Uh, and the uh, the legitimacy of a king was very important so this is what i think uh, in a way continuation of policies there was no unrest when when the king died and naturally other things followed so this is what i think contributed to the rise of western civilization and some people say that christianity contributed to the rise of western civilization in a way it did but the rise of christianity brought the, 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 you can say that some principles were given by the uh, Christ, by christianity like the uh, law of succession the uh, the marriage and the the heirs to the throne mm-hmm. but the other the, on the other side it was a hurdle always a hurdle but when renaissance came from that point on Uh, west was at a set course for uh, you know economic and scientific progress mm-hmm. and it 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 brought a lot of things and especially when they invented the printing press and when they invented the idea of children going to school and learning something so that brought a lot of what you would say successful uh, the uh, tradition that led to the rise of civilization all over the world what i would say so the modern civilization in a way is is uh, is a progress that was made in very small steps that took many centuries and uh, you only reap the fruit of this after a lot of people put a lot of effort into it throughout i think the last 5 or 6 centuries even i would say the last 1000 years is the ground from where this uh, the rise of western civilization happened and then the western civilization led to all the other uh, areas of the world to progress because if you talk about china right now or even even you talk about india right now or any country for the matter of say it is the west that has contributed they gave us the education system in a way they gave us the the the, the hospital system healthcare system and and lot of other things even our our canal system in punjab mm-hmm. it was it was it was done by the british so there were bad things to british as well there were some good things to them as well so the yeah. way we are ruling ourselves right now it is also given by them so yeah. in the end it not only we would say it's not you cannot say that it is only the western civilization because now everyone else is contributing mm-hmm. to this uh, this revolution that they brought mm-hmm. no that was like, uh, the question about wars was left yeah wars bring a lot of innovation but that also happened during the last few centuries mm-hmm. i think after the invention of gunpowder people realized that technology could make you win wars so mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. even when they when they developed the when they invented the uh, gatling gun Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Gatling gun, I, I don't know which war it was, the Battle of Tours or no, no, not the Battle of Tours. There was a war between the Muslims and the uh, and the and the British at one point. And the the Muslims were a lot more in number, maybe 10, 1 to 10 ratio was going on there. And the British brought the Gatling gun there. So Gatling gun, just to tell uh, people who don't know about it, Gatling gun is the first machine gun. So the, the the rotating machine gun that you see in Matrix when Neo goes and tries to save, you know, Morpheus. So that is the gun, the earlier version of that gun, the first version of that gun is known as a Gatling gun. It is just like a cannon. It is It has two wheels on the sides and it was developed. And uh, yeah, R.S. Gill is saying in Morocco, I don't remember where it was, but this is how they defeated it, them. And so I think by that time, British had already learned that it was the technology that would make them win wars. It would not be the number of people that would make them win wars. And they also realized that the Navy was crucial for, for uh, you know, uh, developing uh, a strong military, uh, strong, strong military presence anywhere in the world. Because before Air Force, it was Navy. Who, mm -hmm. Whoever had the strongest Navy would be able to win over anyone else. No, and Navy funny. also required a lot of because let if uh, I'll, I'll I'll say that you try to see there some people do these uh, you know boat building uh, projects on YouTube and mm -hmm. you can see that how long does you know a crew working of five or six people or even ten people working on a wooden boat would take them to make it it takes two three years for those products uh, projects to complete mm -hmm. and and even you have to know everything about how to make, work with wood you ha have to know how to work with iron and there is a lot of technology that goes into making these old ships even that were uh, roaming the seas about 500 years ago so that was the state of the art at that moment and no one else was making ships like that at that time so it's 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 still technology at that time was also very important Right. I mean, your answer about uh, the kings having many wives and having children, then naturally there'll be fight is, is so good. And that explains the infighting uh, that, that I think you hit the nail. I wasn't thinking from that angle. I was like, why would there be so much infighting in one, um, in one uh, civilization or one, uh, uh, one uh, kingdom or one, one area versus the other? Well, that explains it, right? Like, you yeah, know, but I, I also have to make one point here that even yeah. according to Harris's debate there, you know, they say that Islam, this Hikachu guy was saying mm -hmm. that Islam protects the family system. Islam that's what, believes that, in that. That's you what know? Hindus say. So, I'm sorry to yeah, 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 cut yeah. you. No, but, like, but I have let's, heard this hundred times. Like, no, but oh, let's because, stop from the perspective of the Muslims. Yeah. Okay. Because when you have a lot of wives, so are you protecting the family systems when your your sons are going to gut each other when you die? No. So how is Islam protecting? How is uh, how is Islam building a healthy family system? No, because I've seen it. Let's say there are there's a father who leaves behind a lot of wealth, and he has five sons, and they are all from the same mother. Even they would go to great lengths, and some of them would kill some others. So they fight. Yeah. You would find. And there would be a lot of unrest between them. They would be fighting for, uh, for, the, for the property and all of those things would happen. But as soon as another mother is involved, let's say oh there are gosh. two sons yeah. from one and the two sons from other. So that is just too horrible. It is just, it is bloody. Most of the time it is bloody. Not when kings are involved. Even in, in, in normal circumstances, it is bloody. Regular so families. This is how... Yeah. This is how Islam destroys the family system. It, it is how it is. And then you put on the put in between the sons of these slave girls and everyone else, then the things become even much more complicated because then definitely some of the sons do get killed. And this is how it happened. That the the Turkic the Turkey Caliphate, the the the, 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 uh, the Ottoman Empire, whenever the king died, except the Except the, you know, what you would say, the crown prince, they would kill, kill everyone else. They mm. used to do it. They used to do it. So 
if they say that islam builds on the family system islam destroys it when you allow polygamy the 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 family system is already dead and Not it sure. is evident throughout the islamic history uh, husain's step brothers they were just like slaves anyone else you name in the islamic history anyone there who was there mostly always it was the war of succession a war of succession was inevitable though it be the moguls or anyone else anyone else in the islamic world though it be chechnya or kazakhstan or tajikistan or turkey or it, it, afghanistan anyone and anywhere when the king had 10 12 wives and he had children from all of them whenever he died you know one of them would end up killing all the others so this that is how is, it happened yeah that is so true such a good point galib i i took a circle back your thing about the debate yeah family values when you suppress someone uh, you suppress your wives and keep them and that preserves marriage and he kind of gave a stat saying oh when when yeah. children live in families that are intact meaning having a mother and a father they do better i will tell you that i will tell you from personal observation from data that is not true if this constant fights right if 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 there's a lot of fights in a house i think i've changed my mind you know I, i'll i'll say this and i'll i'll leave I, i know you have many people to talk to you it's very funny so i came in the united states in the 90 in 97 right now consider i um, also came in from india right so when you come in from a culture you think your culture is better and uh, th- one day three of three of uh, three friends of mine and i were driving to the hills of kentucky and um, mm-hmm. and and we just was having fun you know 22 year old guys whatever going to school uh, kind of thing and the uh, issue came up right where we all the okay which culture is better is the western culture better so this is a while ago understand 97 right so which culture is better is the indian culture better or is the western culture better i did vote for indian culture being better right i had just come from india a year ago one mm-hmm. of my friends who was a little bit older than us uh, you know he 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 said no i think this is better and we had a, i i just remember this to this day because we had a two hour debate on the ride okay i'm just telling you my own transformation as i grow older i have two kids now uh, you know that time i was a single guy i thought same family system my family is very good my mom and dad never you know lived all their lives together so i have that opinion but as i as i see more families as i see kids i'll tell you if the mom and dad are fighting a lot this is to contradict the guy's point who was debating with harris that it's better to separate the kids will have a lot better life lot of peace a uh, lot of lot of growth you tell me who wants to live in a house where two people and the two people they depend on and love are constantly fighting and even hitting each other sometimes okay that's that's really bad environment to live in instead if they both go their own ways and are able to still interact with each other here and there i know that is not ideal right but this is lot you have lot of in, p- people from india and pakistan listening so maybe this this kind of because i used to think the other way too but if two people separate and not fight it is better than them staying together and fighting constantly right so that that's that's just a personal thing i've observed so yeah yeah because uh, i think we are kind of uh, bred in such a way where we think that uh, women should just be bowing down their heads before their men Mm-hmm. and our mothers are you know too much compromising when it comes to our fathers and and we can see that uh, you know it was the decisions of our fathers that were carried out and mothers did not had that much choice uh, to you know disagree and uh, as we get older as you are telling then we come to realize that what mistakes even our parents made right at at a younger age you think okay our parents you know did not make any mistakes they were perfect people but the the older you get and and you also come to realize that there were a lot of difficult choices that they made so you also appreciate them more but you also learn that they are also they also made a lot of mistakes they human and beings. i think yeah. overall as a society i think uh 
if you if someone thinks that if someone is forced to do something and they just keep on doing that and it works for someone else it's it's a good thing i think that person cannot think about the, the responsibility that we has as human have as human beings because if we are human beings we also have a responsibility that we should understand that other people have uh, what you would say emotions as well they should be allowed to make their choices and most of the times we never give this chance to our women to make their own choices exactly so yeah that's all yeah, yeah. thank you very much thanks okay. for your time okay. today bikali take care bye bye. bye bye hi amit yeah you had hello ali bhai there. how are you i'm good good how are you acha yeah. uh, uh, today i have come to convert you in a new religion that i have been converted into <laughs> okay. and okay. i am yeah. i am very sure that you are going to convert okay okay so what's okay, that i have uh, sent you uh, two emails if you can please you send me email okay yeah wait wait i'll have to open out look here and it is going to take a little while before okay I... so in the meanwhile so... i'll just uh, uh, talk about the religion that religion is okay so jedi, jedi religion, religion in uk yeah, yeah okay uh, now yeah. i got it so, so should i open the first in... one or the second one first uh, uh, both of them you can open uh, the first uh, one is the code of conduct uh, for the religion and the second one i have sent you the census map uh, of 2001 uh, uk uh, religious census map mm -hmm. so, so what happened in 2001 uh, there was a census going on in uk uh, uh, so, so this is the jedi religion yeah yeah uh, uh, this is the 33 jedi really uh, uh, teachings to live yeah. by this yeah, is kind yeah. of uh, code of con uh, uh, code of conduct that one has mm -hmm. to live by mm -hmm. so, so jedi what happened in, in the living force yeah ha ha you can you can actually read them uh, one by one and i am sure that you will agree with the uh, Most yeah. of them. So Jedi believe that there is a dark side, but refuse to dwell on it. Jedi serve the living force. Certain Jedi are stronger with the force than others. Jedi live in the present moment. Jedi can feel the force. The so present moment means that they do not believe in an afterlife. Jedi yeah. can feel the force. Jedi trust their feelings or, or intuitions. Jedi practice meditation and achieve a calm mind. Jedi practice awareness and are mindful of the, their thoughts. Jedi have patience. Jedi protect the and defend the helpless. Jedi avoid acting on the dark side emotions like fear, anger, aggression, and hate. Jedi stay physically fit for uh, many reasons. Lightsaber dueling is the Jedi's sport of choice, and you know uh, I I I totally disagree with this because lightsaber <laughs> duels are you know uh, in the newer movies they have made kind of uh, the lightsaber fights into a joke because in the uh -huh. in the previous movies like. whenever there was a lightsaber fight someone would lose an arm or a leg or maybe someone uh, would lose a, ha a uh, head even so jedi believe in destiny jedi believe in letting go of their attachments jedi believe in the life after that life okay after now death. they now they uh, now they believe okay, in that so jedi this, use the uh, force for good works <laughs> jedi have compassion jedi believe in peace and religion jedi peace and justice Jedi are humble and believe that they can always work in improving themselves. Jedi believes in service to others, are selfless. Jedi are devoted to their mission in life. Jedi are always mindful of mindful of the force, and Jedi work for mutual advantage of symb or symbiosis. Jedi believe in the law of attraction. <laughs> okay, what is the law of attraction? you ask for you know, okay jedi believe in democracy but you really don't trust politicians jedi believe <laughs> that they need to bring balance to the force within okay jedi train on oh, oneness or union with living force jedi believe in and are a part of jedi order <laughs> jedi can see the future through the force jedi can feel disturbances in the force jedi have a keen sense of humor so <laughs> what is this so uh, uh... Yeah. this is the jedi religion and we can laugh yeah. over, uh, on it na yeah. but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 i'll tell you something ali bhai there are mm -hmm. almost 4 lakh people 
who follow this like people ha huh. yeah. who follow this religion and actually <laughs> in uh, us texas uh, the jedi religion has been given a, uh, a religious uh, status as well uh, uh, oh. status oh my and yeah, <laughs> it, uh, 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 the church of jedi order the other uh, temple mm. of jedi order is the name mm. of the uh, is the name there and it it has been granted irs tax exemption also so is george lucas a jedi believes in the jedi religion or not <laughs> i don't think so because actually this, but is he a god started... is he their god or not <laughs> you know <laughs> he may be he may be he should be he should be because he is uh. the one who created this religion a jedi is vegan i think he may be uh, something like gabriel <laughs> Jibril He's kind Gabriel. of thing, uh, because and, uh, he, he brought the whole thing to the real world. Where is where is Yoda? Where is Yoda? You know, <laughs> you need to have a Yoda because the you know without baby Yoda, uh, Jedi religion is no fun. You know, <laughs> Yoda is also a Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Yoda, Yoda is the Jedi. This this small stature, green guy. You know. Jedi is uh, Vanita ji is asking Jedi is vegan. No, Jedi are not Jedi vegan are, because no. I have seen the little Yoda eat yeah, yeah. rats and all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, so, this, so Jedi religion in England and Wales, two thousand one. So it is as early as two thousand one. The Jedi religion was very, you know, yeah. So zero point nine one to one point four people. percent jedi my god <laughs> so the yellow ones are the ones that have mm. 0 to 0.5 so I've, so uh, you know uh, how much five people in a thousand are a, are jedi yeah. in the yellow ones and 14 people in a thousand are you know jedi in the blue ones and in between huh. you can see so yeah and this was way, and this was way back in 2001 and now it has gained so much traction Yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually a thing uh, in UK. Yeah, but I would say even then, Jedi religion is better than all of these religions that uh, were invented uh, in the past centuries. Uh, <laughs> yeah, still it's better because at least Jedi would always want to go to space. You know, maybe discover something, mm. uh, find. So, Galib, but if we that. don't have any choice, <laughs> and if yeah. there, uh, if there ever uh, uh, is a situation that we have to choose something, mm. then we'll convert to this Jedi religion. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay, so Amit, you would stay, and I would take ah. Bhagwan. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, Galib. Okay. Yeah. Hi, hi. Hi, am I audible? Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are, you are, loud and clear. Yes, yes. So, I was listening yeah. to your initial. You know, you were talking about Texas and uh, abortion yeah. and all in US. Yeah, yeah. So, the one question which comes to mind: Are the women in USA in every state are very different in their needs and requirement? Means. If you look at their map, in one state, Texas, it is now six weeks where for which abortion is allowed. Beyond mm-hmm. that, it is not allowed. In other states, there are states where twenty-four weeks it is allowed. So yeah. it's a very strange situation in a very advanced country, and uh, it gives uh, you know fodder to people like Daniel Hukachu and people like them to make fun of. others and you know they get a point in uh, criticizing others means this advanced religion or advanced countries they get a point because of this nonsensical uh, way of uh, addressing abortion and uh, health issues so if you if you know that just in 2021 india has also amended their uh, abortion laws anyway mm-hmm. abortion was allowed in india mm-hmm. so now in 2021 they amended whatever law was there in 1971 there was a law for medical termination of pregnancy and abortion mm-hmm. was not made means it was not legalized the spirit was not because to give the women the right to their body the spirit was to make it a contraception type of thing 
so mm-hmm. that people who get pregnant can go and have an abortion so uh, and uh, in the previous law it was there that till the uh, 20th week you can go and get a pre- uh, abortion done now in the new law it has been extended to 24 weeks and mm-hmm. previously if there was any contraception failure which means somebody wants to have an abortion basically so mm-hmm. that woman has to be a married woman now the law mm-hmm. has been amended and it has been made that any women can go means the, the it does not matter if the person is more than 18 years old the lady she can go and get an abortion done and she did not take her means uh, permission of the husband or any any partner will also do means she did not she can go alone also and the, the other thing is privacy has been given to them so i am saying that See, women in a certain geographical area have similar needs. I was actually also going through the abortion rules of Pakistan and Bangladesh because of this mm-hmm. silly religion thing. See, mm-hmm. women of Pakistan, women of India, and women of Bangladesh have similar needs. They don't have proper access to contraception, so they may have they they are also forced because uh, it has been found that 50 to 60 percent people don't use contraception so they will have unwanted pregnancy so it is required when we talk about sar countries and all there are need that we should have a laws which are also similar we should always learn from each other and have laws which are similar unfortunately uh, when religion comes in medical field it creates havoc my position is that in the medical field, it is the patient and the doctor, means medical fraternity, who should decide what is best and maybe the government should be like there for uh, regulation. But because governments are forced by the, their, you know, uh, these people, their vote, vote banks. So they come up with all this useless type of nonsensical type of laws. So it is a very sad thing the what they are doing in Texas and Texas is a very important state. It is not one of those states without a big population which can which used to do all these things. So it is a means USA should not give lecture to anyone. First they should address their own problems properly. Otherwise people will have point to means to point out this all problem which even in schooling if you see in USA there are so many faith schools are there. What is the need to have faith schools? They yeah, Catholic so- schools, the convents are still there, you know. Yeah, it means in yeah. India, we when we talk that now people are slowly in India, Pakistan, you know, we have a uh, uh, we we have we have glorified this convent school education. We think yeah. anyone who passes out from it is good. So when hmm. people try to say why let us get out of this convent education, they will say look at USA, they also have. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, yeah. even USA is also doing it for the, there are certain things where I think government should put their feet down, especially in education, because if you indoctrinate a person, no, it is, it becomes very difficult to come out from it later on. I mean, every one of us have gone through it. I think in this uh, session, which we sit, most of us are coming from background where our parents were religious or our setting was religious and we had a great problem in coming out of from it see people like you had physical problems physical <clears throat> means security problem safety problem but even people like us who didn't have the safety issue we still had a psychological there is a lot of dissonance which happens in the mind whatever we studied for so many days why it is all false so you get trust issues are there what is right what is wrong so people should understand this thing and usa being the biggest means demo, uh, strongest democracy and oldest democracy they should not go in I mean, they should have clear cut non means very straightforward laws without yeah but you know uh, uh, what is happening right now is that the American right that is politically motivated by and they are basically run by all of these evangelical pastors 
they are the ones who prepared the ground for a person like Trump to win. And they are the ones who who have a you know majority say in who is going to win the election. Because in the in the Bible belt, it is the pastors who make the opinion that who should win and who should not. So yeah, that, uh, that is and Christianity in a way proving to be very destructive for USA. Especially the Protestant evangelical Christianity. Uh, I wouldn't say that even Catholic Christianity is any any better, but uh, you know the most horrible that we can see right now is the uh, is the what you would say uh, the evangelical Christian Christianity and 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 the issue of abortion. I think uh, I think maybe there are going to be a lot of problems now because. Uh, the doctors who would do an abortion for the right reasons would also be, uh, you know, sued in this lawsuit. Uh, these these problems and it is going to create a lot of trouble. This is practically impossible for a woman to understand. This, this is basically bl like blasphemy law. Anyone can, anyone <laughs> can, you know, do anyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the nail on the head. Blasphemy yeah. law of Pakistan. Yeah. And yeah. And when they do things like this, countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan get a chance to, you know, use yeah, all yeah. this to point out that are in your country also you are doing things like this. Why yeah, are yeah. you pointing out us yeah. on us? We are also doing so. It is a, such a means uh, it is it is a big disappointment. Uh, next they will I think they will do something about organ donation and all because this thing will not stop here. And what happens? It it hurts the people from the lower strata of the society. Suppose yeah, a definite. Woman, poor woman in Texas gets pregnant, either she will, if she is poor, she cannot go to another state to get up uh, this abortion done. Yeah, yeah. And if she yeah, stays yeah. here, she will, if she has a baby, she cannot uh, means take care yeah. of that baby. Yeah. So she will yeah, go yeah. to some unknown, uh, unregulated uh, this center. So this is just like those days when they had, you know, during 1930s, they had banned alcohol in USA. So it's yeah. something like that only. So when I think this internal politics of USA is very, it is going through a very bad situation right now. So yeah, it's, yeah. Very... yeah it's, it's, it's just horrible. It's just horrible. It's too horrible. And the, the problem is now there is no other uh, country which can you know, balance out USA. Previously, there was this another block was there, at least communist block was there. So something, some way of was there to see some direction was there. Now it is unipolar type of thing. So it is very yeah. difficult. Yeah. So do you have anything else? Yeah, yeah. so you were, you were discussing about this. Yeah, let me just read a few super chats. Ralip Kumal, yes. I would only wish I uh, could transplant your brain when arguing with the religious people. Okay, so you know, I only have one brain, so who can I donate it to? Yeah, may the force with, be with you, everyone. So yeah, the Jedi religion is there. Yeah, Dag. So what next? So what we were discussing about, why did Europe uh, Europe uh, advance so much compared to Eastern countries? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things is when Mughal emperors came to India, they became totally complacent. They thought we have, we have <laughs> captured everything and everything is so nice. So they became complacent. They didn't have any challenge in their life. Their only challenge was their brother who they had to kill after their father died. Or some of the uh, Islamic people also killed their fathers also for the throne. So yeah. I was I was listening to uh, Parvez Hudboy. He was in one of his videos. He was telling that when the British people came to Jahangir's court, they they gave him they, uh, this uh, binocular, not binocular, but this... Uh, uh, binocular, uh, binocular type of thing, no? The single lens thing. Mm -hmm. you can yeah, see telescope, it. telescope. That is telescope. Yeah. So Jahangir never asked for the technology. He only said, "You next time when you come, you give me 30, 40 more pieces of this." So the yeah. mindset itself was not there; it was gone. Yeah. Gunpowder was actually used by the, uh, the Islamic forces when they attacked India, and by that yeah, they yeah. could. Actually, they did not capitalize India. on it. They did not try to yeah. reinvent it, make it better. You know, 
the british were moving mountains using dynamite and they were just, they were still sitting on their assets yes yeah. and the other thing is uh, the uh, this uh, one thing what you have said that succession planning is not there see aurangzeb had very good he had actually captured whole of india actually but he did not have a succession planning when he died he left his sons because he himself had come after fighting so he must no but if they would they would announce the successor in their own yeah, lives would, what would happen is one of the other so, kings would kill kill them that's why they they were scared to announce the because yeah, the son all would, of their the son sons would, would be the against father. them yeah, yeah. Yes. all of their sons would be against them if they would announce that who would be the successor and we will also have to thank the churches because newton and all they were support although newton was a religious person but many of the churches gave funds to scientific people also and yeah at that time especially the time, anglican church a, was a little better than the catholic one always yes. so uh, th- because yeah, and, and they are also you know why they gave funds to newton was because the in charge of the, the head of the church was the monarch that's why yes they would give funds to guys like newton so it was again the church couldn't meddle its you know head into all the affairs because the king was or the queen was the in charge always and the other thing i found with the europeans was one good thing is they they are not uh, restricted with their diet also muslims had this problem with pork hindus have problem with beef europeans have no problem they can go anywhere yeah, and eat, eat anything it. because yeah, for yeah. them it was a question of survival yeah yeah and, they, and for us it was a question we were very complacent we have to accept it we can, cannot just say so yeah, yeah. and nowadays also we are now i was uh, i was uh, I mean, shocked when people from pakistan or india say that western countries are not good and we are better than western countries means it is shocking the facts are in front of you the data is in front of you the you take the pictures they are in front of you and still you are thinking that you are better than the western countries no but this the part. problem is the only thing that we are better than them in is narcissism yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. that has to change <laughs> yeah only when it, only that would change and we would definitely get better than them we get the level of narcissism down then we start doing something better with our lives and we would create so a better you, society european people they will accept any any knowledge from anywhere and use it they yeah. used our silk they used our spices they never said that we are, we have spices they said we don't have we will use yours so we have to change there has to be a dynamic paradigm shift in our thinking otherwise it will remain as such a thing so that was all thank you for taking me little bit thoda sa hmm okay thank you thank you dad thank you thanks a lot thank see you. you around okay okay bye bye okay baba is there hi hello 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 hola 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 can you hear me sir am i yeah, 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 i can how are you okay. yeah yeah you are. Can. how are you oh i'm fine i'm fine how about you brother i'm good so what do you okay. have ah bhai uh, i was uh, very happy to hear about that thing like you were talking about uh, uh, the nuclear reactor of the thorium thorium nu- yeah, yeah. nuclear reactor yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a great thing yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly people they ain't know about it but it is the best thing ever happening in the nuclear industry what i think What, yeah, what but people are still uh, working yeah, on it. Uh, yeah, we yeah. don't know that how much time it will take before we get yes, a bhai. good, uh, good, you know, working reactor Ji, that bhai. runs on thorium. Ji, because thorium is not th- the end product of thorium is not very radioactive. It yes, is bhai. much less in yes, mass, bhai. so it is very easy yes, to manage. Bhai. Let's say, let's say you have a, a one ton of uh, uh, waste uh, uranium. Uh, uh-huh. but through the uh-huh. thorium you would only produce maybe maybe a few kilograms you yes bhai same on life out of it so thorium is much more uh, environmental friendly its waste is very yes bhai yes yes bhai that's, that's the main thing 
yeah. and by uh, if you even see the effect of the radioactivity radioactive uh, waves the thorium will produce like uh, that will level up the environment in a few hundred years or so but comparatively other uranium and uh, other reactors it will go upon like tens and thousands of years am i right mm -hmm. what do you think what can you come again uh, can you come again uh, that the, the uh, radioactive effect on the atmosphere i'm uh, talking about that thing uh, because, i don't uh, i don't i i wouldn't be able to say anything about that but one thing okay. we know that the waste product is much easier to manage yes. when very much very thorium. much Thorium is much more available in Earth's crust. It is it is easier abundantly, and, uh, abundantly available uranium, and thorium in a way is is not that reactive. When you would develop a core, only then it would be reactive. Even the, the places because when you process uranium, even there is a risk of a lot of problems there. So the, the in that way, the the problems that thorium creates are a lot. Much uh, you know uh, easier to handle than easier. By uh, and yeah. the best thing is this: it's a self breeder. You ain't need any other vessel in that. Uh, am I right? Because uh, in it has other... been a uh, it has been a little time before I you know studied about it. So okay, uh, okay. It will okay, take, okay, okay uh, I don't remember all the details right now because I think oh, okay, it has okay, been. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I by oh, only I think so. But I would make okay. a video about Jeevi. it on my but science for channel sure that, I'm going to that I'm going to launch in the next month. I'm going to by, do a video by please, about it. Uh, yeah. I think you were the only one who talked about this thing. Uh, I was thinking like 0.1 percent people they know about the thorium stuff because like in the World War Two it is it was being used and you know just because of the negligence they ain't even experimented on that. And they start doing it on uranium. Yeah, they did not do. <laughs> uh, they did not start when they started to develop. You know the uh, the re nuclear reactors, civilian nuclear Jibai. reactors for energy purposes. Jibai. Thorium Jibai. was an option, but they did not Jibai. do it because Jibai. they would use the reactors to enrich uranium and make nuclear bombs. So that's the only reason why they didn't did not pay attention to thorium at that time because it wouldn't be able to. It and it is. It would not be used in nuclear bombs. Thorium. Mm -hmm. so it's, okay. It's, okay. It's safer in that way, also. Okay, boy. Okay, boy. I got it. Okay. Uh, the other thing is this, boy. The guy used to come with the IQ of one thirty two. I do remember uh, with Harris, boy. Have you heard about him? Or you? Yeah, yeah. He came to, to me once or twice also. <laughs> okay. Okay, boy. Uh, boy, I never knew about it. Like uh, you have. To babble about or do you have to, you know? Uh, I checked my IQ like when I was a teenager. It was lied upon like one twenty six to one forty, okay? okay, on that range. <laughs> And after fifteen uh, twenty uh, years, it was the same thing. And I just uh, checked the research of Princeton University. What they uh, checked is this: uh, they took hundred uh, young children. And they check their IQ in their age of like twelve uh, years and thirteen years, and after twenty uh, years when they were adults, young adults, they checked them, and the result was the same. And that was mm -hmm. like quite, you know. And by I think so, your IQ might be more than one forty than what I think so. Oh my God, no, no, I don't. Then then by you are our Guruji. Then yeah, the main like, thing <laughs> is that all these online IQ tests you don't tell you anything about you. So. Yes, yes, boy. Don't, don't yeah. those kind of things. No, no, way. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Uh, the IQ test which I'm talking about was that like my uh, Popo. She is a psychologist in Chicago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, when I was younger, uh, she took me like uh, she was having her thesis. So mm -hmm. that's why she took me along with her. At that time, she checked, and the last time it was quite long. Same, mm -hmm. I checked the test because of her. Both the tests was because mm -hmm. of her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then, Anything uh, else you have? Uh, yeah. by, uh, there, there's a connection in this. The guy he they're talking about uh, the family system uh, who uh, came before like uh, Ahmed Bhai. Uh, that Western family system is bit uh, you know uh, ain't a, as good or reliable like an Indian family system. My thing is this: 
people don't get one thing there is a thing iq and there is a thing eq by you might have heard about it mm-hmm. a, a emotional caution okay bhai the people are mostly emotional fools okay uh, the thing is this the people who got level more in the eq are more successful in life they are mostly the politicians and stuff like that because they know how to play with the emotions of others and how to control their own emotions as well okay uh, mm-hmm. a small example in this like uh, if there is a king in in a palace he is not that man genius but his uh, like the subordinate wazir jo hota bhai theek ho gaya but he and he is the intelligent but king is sitting with him because he is he has got more uh, level of eq and the eq uh, thing is based upon when it is in your childhood uh, bhai he was talking about uh, one has to set a part uh, like part uh, set his part ways rather than fighting with each other and stuff bhai you raised a very good point in in our uh, subcontinent we don't take a woman even as an individual as well okay bhai mm-hmm. and Uh, uh, people they just com- compromise on this thing okay uh, they'll uh, make a bad impact on the child psychology if we get uh, divorce or stuff uh, uh, what the society will uh, society will give a bad name to the woman if she you know part uh, uh, if she is not related with the man and stuff you know about it uh, but the thing is this you have to be very much you know truthful to your own self basically okay you don't have to compromise on okay this. okay okay wait 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 baba i will ask this i did not read this super chat and it it is not very good to have this one out okay. yeah uh-huh. antinatalist you cannot convince us about antinatalism but you can definitely send us to the mental asylum you know you know this is not this you know uh-huh. he I, he still sounds a reasonable guy to me yeah okay yeah yeah baba <laughs> Oh, boy! You, you really make a fan of Ventin Nateless. Uh, <laughs> no, no, he, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Why, uh, but the philosophy he's following is a bit like uh, a dark and a pessimist type of thing. So uh, nothing else. Okay, boy. I was telling uh, like about uh, the impact on the child uh, about when the parents they are not in a good relationship, and over here in subcontinent they just put a mask on the face of like. Uh, everything is going well and uh, this is uh, uh, not a good thing basically uh, the child he when uh, at that age he is observing each and everything and that effect that uh, stigma will stay along with him for his whole life and his personality development will be like uh, in a good of what i think by if you want to comment on this thing what do you think yeah because you know the way, way the way things happen is in your childhood affect you a lot and i think this this what you're saying is okay okay baba i'll move on you know okay nice okay bhai okay. uh, the last thing i just want to point it is like uh, with the silly uh, silly point bhai uh, i okay. want to have what, session what's that yeah a uh, uh, bhai uh, uh, session with him if uh, i want you uh, harry bhai and uh, 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 ibnayrim bhai to be like you should have a session with him and i'll arrange it what do you think sahib with sahil adim you with sahil adim bhai he is getting like 1 lakh and 75000 per hour kya phuddu khate lage hain bhai kya baat hai yeah if he wants to talk mm-hmm. i can talk to him but i don't know if he would be able to uh, bhai uh, if he is uh, uh, I'll just message you on your private one. Okay, by the details and the, all okay. the stuff. Okay, by T. Okay. okay, take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for taking me. Okay. Yeah, but I really worry. I I don't think that he would ever agree to talk to me. What do you think, Amit? No, no, he will not buy. He will not. He will never. Because whatever gibberish he is saying, you know, mm. <laughs> he would not talk about. Okay, Ramesh Kumar is there. Hello. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can. How are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. So can you I adjust your mic? The... You know, it is kind of difficult to you know hear. Yeah, you. I think maybe you should. Yeah. Is it is it better now? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, is, it, is it better now? No, your voice is kind of you know your your voice is kind of hurting my ears. I don't know what the problem is with your microphone. Yeah, it's got to do with the cooler I'm using. Okay, so now is it fine now? It's the pitch is very okay. high, sir. Now, the pitch I is think... just too high. Okay, you check it. I'll 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 come back to you. Okay, next I'll let you. Yeah. Okay, Gulzar, bhai, how are you? Hi, good. Uh, fun was going on in chat, and um, I was yeah, enjoying the chat. Their edges. <laughs> so, I sent yeah. you to Hadith uh, for today's Hadith. If you could open, please. About slavery. Okay. So, uh, I yeah, hope yeah. I just opened. Yeah. So this is Abu Daud, Sunan Abu Daud. Uh, yeah, and it is yeah. So Guzar, should I read it or you would like to read it? Yeah, yeah I'm I'm outside. I I'm on phone. I can't okay. A woman that. came to the Prophet and said, "I gave a slave girl to my mother." But she died and left the slave girl. He said, your reward became certain for you. And she, the slave girl, returned to you as inheritance. She said she died and one month's, and one month's fast was due from her. He, the narrator, then mentioned the tradition similar to the one uh, mentioned by Amar bin Awam. So I think what is happening here is she's saying when her mother died, she had missed one month of uh, fasting. So this is what is here. And, and now the slave will be fasting instead of her. Yeah, like uh, here Muhammad is saying about slave girl as an inheritance. That's mm -hmm. uh, another thing that Islam can allow you to mm -hmm. have slave girl as an inheritance, like a property thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many hadith about slavery we can find. And can you uh, pull up another one? Uh, please. Yeah, the second one is also there. I'll just. This is the same one I opened twice. You sent me the same one twice, Kuzar bhai. You sent oh, me the same okay, one twice. Me... Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. The other one let is me not send, there. Let me send. Just yeah. wait for a second. Let me pull up. What was the number of the hadith? Uh... Three three zero nine. You sent me. Oh, okay. Now I'm gonna send you this different one. That's very small one. Uh, okay. Can you open this? Uh, yeah, three forty seven. Okay. I don't know here. Okay, so this is here. Sunan Abi Daud three four two seven. So Allah's messenger, the messenger of Allah, forbade earnings of a slave girl until unless it is known from where it came. Yeah. So people were. The people slave girls were earning for people, and the person should know that where they were coming from. That's all. Right. So this is the morality, and when uh, yeah, Muslim apologists come, yes. In other hadith, we also know that slave girls were also allowed to prostitute as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And something reference can be uh, can come from the Quran also. Someone was talking yeah, yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a morality uh, which uh, I was talking to my friend. The problem is because I think uh, yesterday I did work on some hell, hell, uh, heaven and hell with human with science channel. So I was preparing, I was making my notes for the screen. So I found out actually the problem that Kana Dajjal will come uh, before mm -hmm. Kayamat or Doomsday. But I think, you know, what is Kana Dajjal for Islam? It is WhatsApp. WhatsApp mm -hmm. is actually Kana Dajjal when, uh, when atheists forward these kind of hadith to Muslims. And Muslims mm -hmm. get surprised what kind of religion is that they are following. Because what happened mm -hmm. before social media, Mullah never told these hadith, never told mm -hmm. these verses of the Quran. But thanks mm -hmm. to social media that Islam is going to be very much weak. Uh, coming years, what we all have observed, everybody is mm -hmm. observing. So I was just seeing maybe the Quran can be written by God. Let's assume, let's assume. But the 
the way the hell and heaven has been described in Quran cannot be possible. That's even some cruel person cannot create such kind of hell because there were some verses I found in Quran that you will eat something which will be stuck in your uh, throat. That mm -hmm. how what kind of God is this and this pure written by God and uh, as uh, forget about the heaven. Another thing which I have noticed that people don't leave. Uh, it's me also. People don't leave religion, not because of heaven, but because of the fear of the hell. That mm. yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. Uh, f I think fear is more what we can call humans go for survival for the fittest. So they are more scared about the fear rather than being uh, having some kind of bounty or uh, kind of uh, incentives. So that's another problem that another thing which I was discussing with human with science that uh, every Muslim goes through the trauma about Kabar Ka Azab, like uh, torture in the graveyard, about the hell, and it keeps coming in their dreams. So I would request Muslims, please, if you want to remain Muslim, be remain Muslim. But do not uh, tell your children about the hell. Why? Because they have great torture. So I would end by saying this, that this religion freezes up the brain so badly. Like, for example, every parent will know that horror movie is bad for the kids. They will know, but how come that they don't know that similarly the concept of the hell is also equally bad as a horror movie. I don't know. They cannot differentiate. That's how religion works. It freezes your mind. So that was my all thoughts which I had to share with you. If you have anything to say or Amit. Mm -hmm. then yeah, I will, yeah. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Gunarva, you can stay if you want. Okay, I sure. will just stand in 40-45 minutes. Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. I will try. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so Maxim uh, sent a uh, super chat. Amit Tiwari and Gulzar, when are you having next share or Shari stream? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that you both can tell, like when you want to have it. Gulzar, bhai is scared of me, Galib, bhai, because last yeah, time you, I defeated him. <laughs> you last time defeated him. <laughs> but but did Gulzar, bhai accept the defeat or not? Gulzar, bhai, did you? So hey, yes, I, can, I, 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 can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we uh -huh. can. Yeah, I don't like defeat. Once I got scared, I don't want to uh, be, you know, I defeated again. That's why I'm scared. Amit performed so well. And now I only won victory, either by hooks or crook, but even by cheating. I passed my graduation also by cheating. So um, I love cheating. I don't want to lose that. So Amit, so sorry. Don't don't tell it to Bhaviji that you love cheating. <laughs> You'll get into trouble. <laughs> okay. Ramesh is there. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi, Galib. Hi, hi, how are you? Now, now, how is my voice? Is it better? Or... Yeah, it's it's manageable. Yeah, so what do you have? Yeah, so I want to make a couple of points here. Like, uh, uh, we usually think that religion is like a, a, a virus in evolution, right? Like, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins also used to say the same thing. So uh, actually, I think in a different in a different way. Like I think uh, religion is actually is how how we have evolved. Actually, there's something mm -hmm. called group selection. Do you know about it? Group selection and multi-level yeah, yeah, selection. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. So do you have an opinion on it? Like, uh, do you think? It yeah, is because you know, uh, valid. This this involves this is not about the evolution of human beings. Uh, this is not the biological evolution, but this is the anthropological evolution that we are talking about here. And the group theory, in a way, tells us about how groups behave when you know you uh, you go through all of these things. Groups have insecurities. Groups want to, yeah. So I just want to say that uh, like. Uh, these things like the religious structures and all are mm -hmm. like uh, uh, hardwired into our like evolution. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you if individually we can be logical and all, but if we bring a group together, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Hello. 
Hello. Yeah, I think Ramesh has dropped now. Okay, so Julia Blister is there once again. Hello. Hi, Galeb. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. You know, I want. I had a question for you. What is this? Uh, you know, when they say Muhammad Sallallahu Sallam Sallam, what does that mean? The this Muslim... is basically Darud. Yeah. What's the meaning of it? Like... It means that we send, may Allah send blessings upon him. I see. And also, also many times Muslims say, Prophet, be peace upon him. Why do mm -hmm. they say that? Be, be, be peace peace upon be him. upon him. Yeah, this is basically the translation of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, I see. So be peace upon yeah. him. So, peace be upon him. Peace be upon oh, him. Okay, so they are worried that he won't be peaceful there. He's with a God and he'll have no peace there. Yeah, because, you know, Muhammad is the only prophet in all of the prophets who asked his followers to pray for, for him. There is no prophet in the Bible that would say, people, okay, you pray for me. Oh, so Muhammad, Muhammad asked for it? Yeah, Muhammad asked for it. Okay. One other thing, you know, one day there was this Christian guy. He was telling me about this thing about, you know, servanty to hoods, which always mm -hmm. Muslims crave for and mm -hmm. whatnot. See, when you die and suppose you go to heaven and mm -hmm. finally you meet your creator, God, you know, mm -hmm. who has created mm -hmm. all this thing. You know, if I were to see him, that would give me such a peace and such a tranquility or something. You know, I wouldn't want anything else after that. Why would I care about the other earthly pleasures there? Yeah, because, you know, afterlife is always something that is based upon the wishes and the shortcomings or the the negligences or what you would say that uh, that you did not get in this world. If If someone did not get that much sex in this world so sex is always going to be a charming thing for him and someone else would be able to charm him for sex and this is what prophet muhammad did so paradise is basically uh wishful thinking on another level so when you start to capitalize on the wishful thinking of different people and start to manipulate them for what they wish and you are not giving them anything in this world, but you're saying that, okay, you would get it in the next world. So this is the biggest con job. This is the worst con job that anyone has ever done in the world. So anyone who has an idea of afterlife, though it be any religion, basically all of these people are con men who want you to help them win wealth and power in this world. And they just pro promise you something that would never happen. So religion is the insurance policy that never materializes. It's the biggest lie in the world. So so Abraham, Abraham was the first prophet in this lineage where the where they say Abraham, the... according to the Christians and the Jews, Abraham was not even a prophet. Nu was a prophet, Hanuk was a prophet, but Abraham was not a prophet. He did not make any prophecies. He was just a man of God. That's, that's how Bible mentioned it. So the Muslims started saying that he's a prophet. He's a prophet. So according to the Christians and Jews, he's, according to the Jews, he's their patriarch. And that's it. Nothing else. And, and Moses. Moses is a prophet. He, he went, Moses he is definitely a prophet. Moses is a prophet. He made some prophecies as well. He showed some miracles as well. But Abraham, you know, he had no miracles. Nothing like that. So, so Moses is the one who brought those the, the tablet with the Ten Commandments, right? So the God spoke yeah. directly to him. Yes, God spoke directly to Moses when he went went on the uh, on the uh, uh, you know this uh, Mount Sinai. Yeah. So, so that's what I don't understand. You know that he the God spoke directly to to Moses, but for for uh, Muhammad he sent Jibril to speak to him. He didn't come directly to him. Yeah, he did so, not. So isn't that the, he gave more importance to Moses than he gave it to? to yeah, Muhammad? but in that way, uh, because Muslims are very perplexed when you say that, okay, Jesus had a lot of miracles. What did Muhammad do? And they don't have anything. When you say that Moses has a lot of things, but he did not, uh, Muhammad did not have anything. And Muhammad was even stupider than Moses. When, because when we talk about the Safari Miraj or the ascension to the heavens, you know, Israel and Miraj. So what happened happened there is when the Prophet went to 
the uh, Fizadul Muntaha and he talked to God. God said, okay, your people are going to say prayer 50 times a day. And he came down and he met with Moses and Moses asked him what happened. And he said, my people have been given 50 prayers. So Moses said, these are too many. Go back and get some, you know, get some discount. So he goes up again and God just reduces 10. And then he comes back again and Moses asks him, okay, how many now? So he says, now 40. So he goes back and forth almost four or five times. And after that, he gets the five prayers. So it, it, every time it's Moses who is telling him, okay, you your people have to, your people wouldn't be able to manage. You should get them reduced, get some discount for, from the old man. And literally the old man and the, and the prophet Muhammad, both of them seem very stupid. And Moses seems, you know, infinitely wise than both of them. So, you know, in a way, <laughs> their own hadiths and their own Islamic narrative proves that Islamic uh, prophet Muhammad was not very intelligent and even Allah was not very intelligent. It was Moses who knew that Muslims wouldn't be able to say 50 prayers a day. And he uh, told the Muhammad to get this discount. So one way or another, Muhammad is always, you know, lower than the other prophets even according to the Islamic hadith and everything. You, you know, on the other other front, you know that Afridi, the video you showed the other day where uh, he was uh, he was at Times Square and showed a homeless person and whatnot. And mm -hmm. yeah, homelessness has increased a lot. in yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, homeless, actually, it has become like a third world place in Manhattan during the pandemic, you know. Uh, we had a very liberal mayor and he did it too. But uh, do you know in New York State, you know, they put, they don't even put them in shelters. Now, a lot of these homeless, they put them in the hotels, three-star, four-star hotels. And oh. they stay there for months, you know. And uh, the government pays for them. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing. And all these people who are there on the streets, usually they have some sort of mental problem or mm -hmm. a drug problem or whatever. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they... And, and you know, I mean, one other thing he didn't understand is Mm -hmm. It's not like here, they, even they have, even homeless have rights. You cannot really force them. You cannot take them away from the, the thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Unless they are committing some crime or whatever, or, or, or doing some, you know, uh, squatting in a place where they are not supposed to. They also mm -hmm. have rights and everything. So it's not easy one to one. The, on the other front, you know, I, I saw, I came across this video. I don't, I don't know if you have seen it uh, of uh, Tariq, Tariq Jamil, Maulana Tariq Jamil. And mm -hmm. if, if you get a chance, you can look at it. Maul Maulana Tariq Jamil, British prison prisons. He went to visit. Yeah, the British he went to. Yeah, yeah, he went to preach there. Yeah, but you, you have seen he gave a speech on that. And and I think his his crux was what I got was I you know he was speaking in Urdu. I haven't seen this. This I will definitely look it up. What yeah, you look it up. It's seen because he he was very impressed by this kafir's nizam. You know, so he he. I think I didn't understand his Urdu word, but he was saying, how can we tell they're, they're wrong? You know, they're, they're, their system is better. You know what I'm saying? And he was comparing mm -hmm. it to yeah, Pakistani yeah. prisons. But mm -hmm. it's, it was amazing. You know, you can re you can you can uh, watch it and make a reaction video on it and you compare it. So yeah, definitely. I'll have look. All right. I'll have thank you. Arma. Sure. Thanks for talking. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank Keep you. coming. I'll thank definitely. You. We'll talk next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. See you. Around. OK, bye bye. bye. OK, so. Oxalic acid is there. Hello. 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 Can you unmute yourself? You are on mute. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Yeah. So, what do you want to say? Yeah. Hello. So, um, what problems um, are going to come with the increase of population in Asia? like in 10 years? Oh, you know, right now, the biggest problem that we are going to have in the next 20 or so years is going to be the water shortage. And the partly global warming is the, culp uh, is the uh, one that is going to create this. And in India and Bangladesh, especially, it is China. Because China has built a lot of dams in Tibet Plateau. And all the water that comes into Bangladesh and India is coming from there. Bangladesh is already on a red alert right now for water. 
and india is going to suffer because china is building dams there and uh, on the other hand the tibetan glaciers are also getting reduced so the the amount of water that is right now when china is building the dams there is water that is going to come down into indian rivers but let's say global warming has its way and in the next 20 years the glaciers recede so the the amount of water in those rivers is going to be reduced and all the dams that china built are not going to be filled and there is going to be a lot of problem in india agriculture is going to suffer there are other things that are going to uh, suffer and uh, you know we don't know because there are more than a billion people living uh, in and i would say one and a half billion people are living in bangladesh and india and you know it's going to be terrible so do you think uh, like the increase of a uh, younger population uh, is a benefit for india uh, for like 10 or 15 years uh, i think population should be controlled i think india should not go you know india is already in the population dan- danger zone because it's too many people the resources are not that many the economy is though it's good doing good but if 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 the population increase is just so rampant it is not going to be but india is already going towards that side where it's going to be you know the population is going to get balanced in the next 20 25 years so uh, but there would be other challenges there because uh, there are so many other things than that can harm the people living in asia especially the the water is going to be the biggest thing let's say we reduce the population even then the water crisis is going to be there and and it's 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 inevitable it feels inevitable right now maybe there would be some uh, what you would say revision of the water treaty between uh, the south asian countries including china also though it is not a south asian country but the water treaties and and when india does not get the water so there are two rivers that give water to pakistan so india is also going to block those rivers so ultimately everyone is going to suffer secondly the biggest challenge is going to be automation is going to increase in the next two decades like 20 years ago in in about 2000 and 2002 we the computer revolution started and 10 years ago the the smartphone revolution started and this century this decade is going to be the artificial intelligence revolution you are going to see that everything from cars to drones and all, everything is going to be shifted to artificial intelligence so you wouldn't have any truck drivers driving the trucks or the taxi drivers driving uber drivers driving the cars everything is going to be automated so when this happens lot of people are going to lose their jobs in every industry we are going to see automation reach you know epic proportions and <clears throat> it would be very difficult for people to keep their jobs so the biggest challenge that we are going to have in the third world in the next 20 or 30 years is the first world is going to have this concept of basic income that people who don't have jobs would get everything like they would get homes they would get uh, they would get money they would get free education so the responsibility of government is going to increase so it's going to be a communism of a sort but these corporations on the same hand are going to be their power is going to increase dramatically like tesla is going to be A, a a company that would be much more disruptive than than microsoft or amazon or anyone else tesla is going to be like it's it's going to disrupt the whole fabric of the the society that we are in right now and things would change so rapidly that many of us wouldn't be even able to keep up with that and and the people in the third world like our countries they would be at much more uh, they would be at a much more dangerous spot so people wouldn't have work people wouldn't have the governments wouldn't be able to supply people with all their needs especially in pakistan and india where the health system is in crisis where where the the transportation system is in crisis every everything is in crisis already education system is in crisis and maybe at that point you know this one child policy that we keep on talking about maybe most of these countries when people would not be productive at all 
even the Muslim countries would be implementing this one child policy. Maybe right now we see it as a very dangerous thing, very evil thing when China has implemented it. And even the bad effects of it we are seeing right now on the Chinese society and this gender disparity that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, come into view in the last few decades is going to be much worse in the third world because, and I don't know, we wouldn't have any kind of system where we would be able to compete with the countries that are industrially advanced right now because U.S. would need to, U.S. or other first world countries would have hardly anything that they would want to import from India or Pakistan. Agriculture is going to be changed in such a dramatic way. Uh, I think the farming in the fields and the places where, which we are using right now for farming, all of them will become obsolete. As soon as we have cheaply available nuclear fusion or energy of any other kind, electricity is cheap. All of these, uh, you know, uh, warehouse farming, these uh, this rack farming that we are, vertical farming that we are seeing in large warehouses right now, that is going to become so common that we wouldn't be even able to imagine right now, like how common it would be. We only need, and that is pesticide free. That is, uh, you know, uh, that would be the best quality food that anyone would be able to get. So, uh, you know, uh, if, 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 uh, if Pakistan is exporting cotton to USA, US wouldn't need the cotton to be ex imported from Pakistan because they would be growing it in their own warehouses through vertical farming or something like that and and they wouldn't need anything to import from pakistan so what how would we earn the foreign revenue how would we support our people in some ways technology would make our lives easier but they would it would also make our lives difficult and and in the third world there is not even a beginning uh, you know we are not even beginning to think about this these problems right now um okay so uh, my last question, uh, how many years will it take to colonize Mars? That is also always a, what you would say, that is always around the horizon. Let's say, let's see. When US went to moon in the 60s, at that time, everyone thought, okay, in the next 10 years, we would be at, on Mars. So what happened later on was, you know, the, the biggest failure that US had ever was the failure of the satellite program, the shuttle program. So you NASA shuttle program, that is the biggest failure. The biggest technological failure that ever happened in the US was the space shuttle program. And basically why it happened was when US went to the moon, after that, Russia, uh, you know, uh, admitted its defeat. Russia did not want it to go to moon and there was no one else in, on the face of this earth who had the capability to chase US to the moon. So US became complacent and uh, a few Republican presidents that came after that, they were not willing to spend large sum of money on, on, the, on the space program. Even the Democrats did not want it to do it. So they started this space shuttle program. The space shuttle program was... Space shuttle was totally re reusable in a way. They developed it as a reusable system. But the two disasters, one that happened in 1984 and the other one, the Columbia disaster. Uh, the first one was the Challenger disaster that happened in 84. And the second one was the 2003 or 4, the Columbia space shuttle uh, incident. Both of them, after the Columbia space shuttle uh, disaster, after that, the US astronauts were going to the International Space Station or going to the space on the Russian rockets. So what happened was that US was always thinking that in the next 10 years they would go to Mars, but they never did it. And even right now, Elon Musk is saying that he would go to Mars, but we don't know. He's saying that people would be there before 2025 on on Mars. I don't know if he would be able to keep his promise or not. And just a few days back, Elon Musk has heavily criticized Joe Biden. He said that Joe is sleeping. So US should at least go to moon in the next three, four years. And I think right now, uh, NASA has an opportunity because 
SpaceX has developed a very dependable technology that can enable NASA to go to moon very easily and even NASA and SpaceX can go to Mars very easily. But uh, I think the technology is there. I don't know if the commitment is there or not. That's And I am I'm really sad about it. I, I want people to go to moon and go to Mars. I don't know if the commitment is there because this is what I fear. I think that uh, these countries, like now, I think even COVID has delayed going to Mars or moon because a lot of money that might have been used to go to moon or go to space or go to other places in our solar system would be used to deal with COVID. So the bad economy that COVID has brought is going to hurt the the urge of uh, humankind to go to Mars as well. OK. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you. See you around. OK, see you. OK, so Maxon is saying, hi, all friends. Can we have one stream with Ghalib and Haris as an appreciation day with them for their endless, thankless work for humanity? Yeah, that you guys can plan. And maybe we would be there. OK, so Muhammad Ali is saying, Ghalib Kamal, I am angry with you. You put Mulana Tariq Jamil on number five. He's my favorite Malvi. Afterwards, the poll provokes that I was right as Mulana. Yeah, but Muhammad Ali, I put Tariq Jamil on number five. The first number was Mulana Abdul Aziz because he's a terrorist. The second spot was for Hafiz Saeed. Hafiz Saeed. He was also he's also a terrorist. And the most destructive mullah on social media or internet is Zakir Naik. So uh, he's also very dangerous, and and that's why I put him on there. And I think right now Tariq Masood is causing more damage than uh, Tariq Jamil in the Pakistani society, especially when it comes to women rights and misogyny that he brings. So that's why I placed him on the number five. So uh, I think maybe you dislike him more than anyone else. But yeah, it's it's like a little bit different there. Julia Blister is saying next war is going to be over water resources. Yeah, yeah, this is what I fear. OK, Sultan Salatin is there. Hello. Hi, Khaled. Hi, hi. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Um, I would disagree. I would put Imran Khan on top of the list as far as misogyny and um, uh, towards yeah, but, women. But concerned. that was a ranking for mullahs. I know, but he's becoming a mullah. Uh, he's in the race. No, I think uh, there if there was a race between Ziaulak and him, he would win. Hands I down. agree. I yeah. agree. Um, um, I think uh, yesterday I sent you a link on um, about that health uh, card that Balochistan is coming up yeah, with. Yeah, you did. You did. Yeah, and I'm just going to open it. It's a Islamic. I think if it, there would be really a Riyasat Madina, this is this is exactly how it will be because apparently hmm. um, there's no plan whatsoever. They have just hmm. announced that about. Two point um, at about one point eight something million families would get access to this um, health card, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which apparently is not even a health card. You can mm -hmm. use your ID card. There's every person in Balochistan who has an ID card would mm -hmm. get a, um, uh, insurance mm -hmm. for one million rupees. In 500 hospitals that are there in Balochistan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, why I say this sounds Islamic? Because there's no planning. There's no budget allocation for it. They are just mm -hmm. announcing it randomly. And they say that 500 hospitals are going to buy their own medicine. Mm -hmm. Where the price would be set by the government. But there's no mention of how this is going to happen. Who in the world is going to be responsible for allocating budgets? If you have health insurance in Europe, you pay through your income, right? Mm -hmm. You are either uh, covered by the government in the insurance or you're covered through your salary to do that. Now, this has nothing to do with that. There's no mention of what kind of treatment you'll get. There's no mention of um, you know uh, where this insurance would be paid to nothing at all mm -hmm. and it sounds 
really um i mean how can the government announce something so vague and not planned nothing has it seems that they just announce it to make people happy but mm-hmm. what do you think in riyasat e madina a health insurance should look like i think riyasat e madina had no health insurance that's why i said that uh, they would exactly they would just what? put you if, let's say if you get some disease they would give you you, you know camel urine and camel milk and you know you would be just running around that's all so maybe Imagine. if if you if you want to follow riyasat e madina's health insurance or health care system so you should only raise some camels and you know you should uh, you should uh, uh, you know milking them and uh, collecting their urine and people should drink of it that's all that's and the only more. type of health care system that was provided by the prophet in riyasat e madina that's all that's or that's, his sweat that's, or that's urine or yeah. mohammed sweat or urine yeah. Uh, apart yeah, from mohammed that. mohammed yeah mohammed was also you know kind of a camel also so <laughs> what what can i say here so that's but it. apart from that imagine in riyasat e madina with hands chopped off all the thieves with their hands chopped off and this kind of insurance but nowhere in the world i have seen something so absurd Mm-hmm. in planning and be the, uh, the here it says uh, aliani uh, mm-hmm. the health uh, has announced that but in the other news it was nurul haq the ed- medical education secretary mm-hmm. i mean where do you see such announcement happening that the government officials announce something so stupid and so vague yeah that's that's all that's there that's there so I, I, i will show you another card that was issued by pti government and that was the real card that has been issued by them for a very very long time and people have been using it and uh, that's this is the card through which people have survived so far <laughs> so this is the sabar card the patient this is the patience card that <laughs> pakistani government has issued for all the citizens and people are go- growing impatient and that's why this card has been issued for <laughs> anyone who can yeah on the top it says in allah min as-sabirin <laughs> yeah yeah in allah min as-sabirin so this is the sabar card and what's written on the top uh, galib bhai that in allah, allah is with the ones who are patient sabar me sabar card <laughs> yeah, so uh-huh. this is basically the patience card that people are using since imran khan came into the it the shouldn't be so. sabar card it should be ghabrana nahi hai card <laughs> yeah i think there would be a ghabrana nahi hai card as well the the news of it hasn't reached us so far <laughs> this is what i think it's it's still there yeah <laughs> and rather than the government spending so much money and effort on you know a single curricular system mm-hmm. and up in the molvi thing and all the planning of that uh, religious uh, education system if they invest on education healthcare i mm-hmm. think people would have a better you know mm-hmm. uh, life and um, but no apparently no one cares Mm-hmm. they are more exactly. concerned but i had an argument with my friend on single curriculum e- education system khalid a friend okay. of mine i just spoke to and he was saying that it's ma- not going to make much of a difference hmm. because in his i would like to have your take on it because he says ke uh, the society is so already becoming so polarized and it is so charged up with religious sentiments that i- i- changing the curriculum wouldn't you know uh, make any difference because people are already religious what's your take on it no i i don't think like that because uh, people are in a way people are already religious but what i feel is that uh, when you put this kind of uh, curriculum then you require a lot of lot more mullahs to be hired by the education system and mm-hmm. as soon as you know i can remember from my back in my school days the islamiyat teacher was always at the front of all of these co curricular activities as well in the hmm. assembly in the morning he would be the one reading the arabic dua hmm. 
and uh, in in even in and he was the teacher who was the most every other teacher would have to prepare a lecture or something like that he he did not need to do that he was the mm-hmm. he was the most relaxed one but he would you know create the most problems for students he would okay. be looking around like uh, what is what every student is doing what kind of things are happening all of that was controlled by the islamia teacher where, wherever and i used to hate them because they were the most brutal against the children always Agreed. and when when you see them having this kind of things so what starts to happen the, the, there is a trickle down effect every te- other teachers also follow his lead and these mm-hmm. things start to happen so uh, the i think the islamia teacher creates problems in the school and basically mm-hmm. most of them are mullahs these qaris all of them and then what happens is uh, uh, f- eventually the school system just goes down and mm-hmm. mostly islamia teachers other teachers are not giving you these moral lectures but right the islamia teacher is always giving you these morality lectures and and especially this they have a very very narrow world view and mm-hmm. and uh, many of the students that back in the day when i used to see this uh, they are very impressed with the islamia teacher mm. so they want to listen about it and they if they would ask him questions about ghazwa e hind and you know what not they ask him they ask him everything mm. they would ask him questions about you know whether they should shave their underarms or not whether mm. what should happen and most of the times they would ask him very vulgar questions and he would be very happy to answer those this is mm. how i felt at that time mm. and mm. I, i i i also see that there was an arabic teacher i was at imcb at that time i don't remember this guy's name but he was kind of always telling children very vulgar stories i think we were at in 7th or 8th class at that time he was always mm. telling extremely vulgar stories he would even tell that Uh, one story that he used to tell was that he went to mari and he had sex with a prostitute he was mm. telling this story to 6th and 7th class students can you mm. can you imagine mm. like this is what he was telling to these these students mm. and and the the boys would just last uh, just laugh about it that he was mm. telling such kind of stories but mm. you know if you'd see it from this kind of perspective it's just it's just too horrible it's just too horrible mm. I think now me, I can understand what he was doing. He he might hmm. have abused a child as well. I, we don't know. We don't know. Quite he might have know. abused a child as well. If yeah. he was telling such vulgar stories to children, like uh, how he was having sex with prostitutes, he would all he would also have abused someone. We don't know. There were thousands of students in, at that school. Who was the victim? We don't know. Maybe he hmm. was doing it. Yeah. Um. As I said uh, earlier on in one of your uh, streams, I think uh, that. i was myself um, when i was in class 7 i mm-hmm. was made to stand on a chair for the whole day just because mm-hmm. i said i don't, don't offer prayers and imagine mm-hmm. an embarrassment of a child yeah. um surrounded by everyone and everyone is saying they have and uh, you're just singled out and your teacher looks at you as you're you know filthy or you're not worthy enough and uh, that was uh, quite a long ago and it was imagine now that the uh, in e- even in my college i was in all girls college and the islamia mm-hmm. teacher would be the one who would come and tell us that don't put your sashes your dubattas in a v form that's a victory sign for the yahudun nisara and i was my god just spread the dubatta uh, evenly out and you're not supposed to bear it like that that's the absurdity and the second problem that i have with schools having this kind of indoctrination is that you're giving it that more uh, much more importance mm-hmm. in school you're teaching children how they are going to be in their future life mm-hmm. that's you know setting the uh, the groundwork for their whole life and if you tell them that these kind of things are so important that it's included in your curriculum mm. at that age where your mind is very you know uh, flexible it can absorb everything it can mold into it mm. that's scary for me yeah yeah this is what is going to eventually happen i remember that uh, in, in even even in my first year or second year i i don't remember uh 
there used to be this prayer that used to happen the afternoon prayer and most wow. of the students would be there and uh, saying that prayer and uh, half of them would even miss the class half of the uh, class wow. that was going on they would just miss that and hmm. and the the teacher wouldn't be able to say anything to them he would start the lecture whichever teacher it was but he wouldn't say tell them anything but at that point even i think at that point it was it was not that con- kind of uh, forceful or the students were not that much pressured the ones who are who were not saying the prayers were not pressured to say the prayers but now you hmm. know they have now the students of the third or fourth standard in pakistan have these prayer diaries so the the prayer attendance diaries they have right now and they might yeah. as well convert the schools into mosque that's oh, what is yeah. left this is this is yeah yeah any yeah. else thank this you karan okay 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 thank you sultan see you around okay see you around. bye bye okay so yeah so uh, this was a video a little while back but it is in urdu so i don't think that i've shown it on my english channel i did show it on my urdu channel so let's see let's show it here once again i don't know if i showed it man sab par nabi jan sab ko ru hu matlab matlab ki ke sarkar do alag so this is an islamic teacher who is saying that anyone who blasphemes against our prophet should be murdered so these are 6 7 class students they are really young i think 12 13 year olds they are sitting here and this is the islamic teacher and this is the kind of indoctrination and hateful ideology that is you know filled into them these students sallallahu alaihi wasallam ne irshad farmaya ki amar tak jo banda bhi nabi ke bare mein baat kare kisi bhi nabi ke bare mein baat kare usko kaat ke rakh de so he is saying the prophet said till the day of day of judgment anyone who says anything against any prophet should be you know gutted or butchered this is the word that he is using sarkar ne farmaya nara suna hua gustaf ke nabi ki ek salaam sar tan sajda sar tan sajda so now he is using this mainstream slogan that has been made mainstream by this tehreek e laba khadim husain's party and he is saying that anyone who blasphemes should be beheaded so this is the slogan that he is using here yaad hai nara sahab is waqt par jehde wajooda surte aale na aale ko par chanda ke jehde sare bacche ne nabbi da gulam saade ke nal koi fikr nahi si ke hor to 14 saal mein saal mar hi jana lekin jehde tusi vi saada sarmaya ho pakistan da oh kende na bacche nu naap ke rakho thale na bacche nu naap ke rakho so he is saying that all you young ones the west has a very you know keen eye on you they want you to behave in a certain way so he is now conspiring against the west against these children who are sitting in these schools and he is indoctrinating hate into them against the west right now ena bachcha sirf khed te lao gel balle te lao jina haaki te lao jina kadi aaya na pata chale kasi na kashmiri te jaa so he is even saying that the west wants you to play cricket hockey and other sports they don't want you to go to jihad on, in in kashmir this is what is said so he is saying not only kashmir you have to go to ja- to syria you had have, have to go to burma you have to go to afghanistan on jihad this guy is you know preaching jihad in a school not in a madrasa in a school agar aaya dasso sare nuksan ho jayega lekin assi sikhna sare kuch इंडियन ओपरेशन इस्लामिक स्लोगन गट एनी वन सेज एनी थिंग अगेंस्ट द प्रॉफिट बिहेड एनी वन सेज एनी थिंग अगेंस्ट द प्रॉफिट और नारा तुम याद करना नारा मैं मन सब पा नबी 
ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕੋ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਫਾਤ ਤੋਂ ਦੂਰ ਹੋ ਤੇ ਹਰ ਬੱਚਾ ਇਸਲਾਮ ਨੂੰ ਯਾਦ ਕਰੇ ਹਦੀਸ ਮੁਬਾਰਕ ਹੈ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦੇ ਹਦੀਸ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਮਨ ਸਭ ਪਰ ਨਬੀ ਜਨ ਫਾਤ ਤੋਂ ਦੂਰ ਹੋ ਮਨ ਸਭ ਪਰ ਨਬੀ ਨਾਉ ਹੀ ਇਜ਼ ਸੇਇੰਗ ਥੈਟ ਐਨੀ ਹੀ ਇਜ਼ ਮੇਕਿੰਗ देम ਚੈਂਟ ਥੈਟ ਐਨੀਵਨ ਹੂ ਸੇਸ ਐਨੀਥਿੰਗ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਫਿਟ ਐਂਡ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਆਨਸਰਿੰਗ ਸ਼ੁੱਡ ਬੀ ਕਿਲਡ ਸੋ so this is what he is teaching there the the i i can tell you that the this is the substandard education that is provided in these schools Galib, and, and, he will yeah. be straight away arrested if he speaks yeah. uh, 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 something like this in some uh, uh, secular country yeah yeah this guy should be arrested he is he is mm. a head monger he is a he is mm. a head monger okay we are going to talk to murani saab and next we are going to talk to mo and then we are going to end hi hi murani saab how are you hello guys how are you i am good i am good so okay. yeah what do you have storm pilot sent a super chat thank you storm pilot mo also sent a super chat yeah those are already i read already yeah so yeah murani sir what do you have okay i was going through this book of revelation uh-huh. and i i came across this chapter 16 uh uh-huh. verse 15 to about 17 there's more to it about blasphemy also but i would just go ahead and go and read about 15 to 17 which is very short uh-huh. okay Behold I am coming as a thief blessed he who watches and keeps his egg, uh, garments lest he walks naked and they see his shame mm-hmm. and they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew an Armageddon Armageddon mm-hmm. then then the seventh angel uh poured out his bowl into air and loud voice came out of the temple of heavens for the throne saying it's all done my yeah. question my question does it this really this is this is one of the four angels talking the four angel angels that would bring the judgment day one of those four angels This is But why did they use the uh, the word Armageddon? I mean did they really know the word Armageddon back in those days? Yeah, the, basically the word Ar- Armageddon is basically Armageddon is a place close to Jerusalem. It's uh, it's uh, it's a place where one of the ancient Jewish wars happened when they fought with the Palestinians when they were with the Canaanite when they were coming in from uh, Egypt. This is how and the last battle according to the last battle between the christ and the antichrist is supposed to happen in the uh, in that battle ground the battle ground of armageddon so armageddon is basically a place of a uh, place near jerusalem in in judea and in urdu or in in hebrew it is known as harmagedon and it's the only the english translation that says armageddon so uh, we always when when we talk anyone talks about a war that would end the world they always say that it's it would be an armageddon or uh, even an extinction event type of thing they would they say okay that's an armageddon so hmm. there there is a very christian undertone to it actually mm okay okay yeah, yeah like i said i mean uh, i was going through this so uh, i was glancing at this book here and i came across this revelation book and yeah. so i read this and now it's like uh, you were online so let me ask him uh, what does that mean really it is it belong to in hebrew or not but uh, anyways uh, i really uh, like uh, when you showed that card uh, what is it called a uh, sabar card sabar card sabar card a patience <laughs> card you know the pakistani mu'minin should only have patience yeah so this is basically the the true representation of uh, imran khan's government because people are you know people are losing their patience now with them yeah okay yeah. uh, uh, along with that uh, about sabr i would say this little boy that comes to your channel very often pretty much uh, yeah. every every every, yeah. every uh every stream that he, you have but 
he's getting a little rude i think don't you think so yeah because yesterday a lot of people told me now he's getting boring so yeah <laughs> so i don't know yeah. maybe yeah, so maybe he's getting I'll really see. rude actually he does not yeah. want to listen i would like to yeah. tell everybody that the host is galib kamal if he puts you on a mute there's a reason why he's putting you on a mute you should not be unmuting yourself let him unmute you and let you speak then you can only speak please yeah. so we can all hear clearly and we can all understand clearly so please don't be rude especially this little boy and i think he's a very intelligent boy actually i think so yeah maybe maybe one day he will change some people think he wouldn't but i think that he can change i don't know when he will yeah 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 okay okay Maranisa, do you have anything else no okay. sir i don't okay okay ah, okay thank you I'll, i'll just end it in after talking to mo okay okay thank you see you then okay. bye bye man bye okay sir bye hello hello yeah can you hear me yeah yeah loud and clear how are you hello mo how are you i'm good amit how are you sir and how are you god i i am doing good i'm good i'm good in a yaar long time you know you have been ab- absent for a very long time <laughs> You can put me in the corner. I'll stand against the wall. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was. You know, I actually came to actually talk about Rabbu Samawat wal Ard, the Lord of <laughs> Skies and Earth. Heaven. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, since you presented the other video early on, before Mr. Morani came in, and I was like. Whoa! This guy is giving a pure violent indoctrination yeah. to those twenty, yeah. thirty kids sitting in there. Imagine when these twenty, thirty kids would then grow up, and then they would indoctrinate each one of them twenty, thirty more. It's it's a ripple effect that we are actually witnessing right now. And mm-hmm. and and, yeah. and to my utmost surprise, that was a. Um, a classroom with some kids who were wearing regular shirts and sh- and pants or trousers so yeah. it was not one of those madrasas kind of schools it was like a mainstream normal regular that we think it's a, it's a private school it's a normal private school somewhere yeah. in punjab yeah, yeah. so uh, i don't know uh, and and the prime minister of pakistan is not doing pakistan is any favor at all yeah he's not oh. he's not at all yeah well so coming to the subject the reason why i called in i looked at several quranic verses mm-hmm. and you know the word the verse rabb samawat al ard is mm-hmm. used abundantly throughout the quran okay so when i when i just focus on the word rabb samawat means is the lord of skies Yeah. Now, where is the sky? It's space. Yeah. Where are those seven heavens? I mean, we have gone all the way down to uh, Alpha Centauri, and we haven't seen any any yeah. first heaven yet in the sight. So this whole narrative of Rabbu Samawat will earth. Yeah, it says in Quran is just one earth means one earth. but there are there could be multiple and it also mentions seven heavens so i would like to you to or mr yeah Rory so there is to comment on that yeah. please yeah so okay. there is a lot of problem in bible and quran both when it comes to cosmology and i always tackle this problem in this way so if any mu'min or muslim or a christian says that you know space is the sky and a quran says that space is the sky because quran says when the jinns go to the heavens try to try to listen something so what happens is we what we do is we send a fireball after them <laughs> so that fireball is basically what it's a shooting it's a shooting star and this shooting star is in the heaven and that heaven is basically space so if we try to conclude from quran that what the first heaven is so the first heaven would be space so now we say that if if the sun and the stars and everything is in the heavens and that heaven is space so where is the earth then yeah. earth is also in the space so 
if you say that earth is earth and space is sky so earth is also in the sky so why didn't the prophet or anyone else know about this because if you say that space is a uh, space is sky then earth is also going through the sky because earth is in the same space in which there are sun moon and stars so exactly. so this is a big problem there for any cosmology of any religion that says that sun and earth sun and moon are in the sky but earth is not in the sky earth is in in earth so earth is also in space and that space also happens to be sky so this is a large this is a paradox there this is a huge paradox that i don't think any of them would ever have an answer for and they would try to do all kind of mental gymnastics but there is nothing for that see um i i go one step further you know it it mentions numerous times many very many times rabbu samawat wal ard means the lord of skies and earth yeah. skies yeah. multiple now when you look at there are at least a dozen or better verses that describe how the skies are layered one on top yeah, of layered. each other yeah, in yeah. fact in fact just a 130 footer atom that that's yeah. His, his head was in the skies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the earth was like only her. I mean, the sky was only 130 foot. Now we have so many buildings that are skyscrapers. So, well, uh, so that's one of the gymnastics. Another question that I would like to ask you, and I know I came to the very last minute. I'm so sorry about that. I apologize because I could not just leave early. But, you know, since you're here, what what are the See, I'm I'm talking to a um, Christian friend of mine. She is Catholic, uh -huh. and she she understands, but she doesn't understand. She's halfway through. I'm trying to take her out of her dogma and whatever, uh -huh. and I need to have three solid, strong arguments that she can never. I mean, I talk about you know, obviously Christianity is not my forte, but you know that's why I'm coming to seek your help. If you can please guide me through and give me at least three good arguments that she cannot deny on those so the first one would be they think that the word of god that bible is it was inspired by god and whatever you know what is written in the gospels all the four gospels were guided by god's hand and matthew mark luke and john were writing this as god wanted them to write so basically whatever they wrote was divine but we have a lot of discrepancies and a lot of changes in the gospel like tell her about john chapter 8 where jesus you know there are some jews who want to stone a, an adulteress to death and that passage is in the gospel of john and jesus saves her from them so it is one of the most beautiful passages that is there in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it was the pinnacle of Jesus' morality when I was a Christian to me. And oh. it still is one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament. But the problem is that that passage is a fabrication. The earliest manuscripts of the New Testament, of the Gospel of John that we have, do not have these verses at all so there is no mention of jesus forgiving an adulteress and saving her from all these pharisees who were about to stone her so the gospel is changed basically there the, the gospel if let's say john was divinely inspired until the fourth century all the witnesses or all the manuscripts that we have do not have this passage at all. So the two best preserved biblical or New Testament manuscripts are the, the manuscript of Vaticanus that is at Vatican City a Library in, in Rome. And the other one is Sinaiticus that is also in the Vatican City Library uh, in, in Rome. And both of them do not have this passage. And we know that in the fourth century AD, the Bible was canonized in the first quarter of, you know, 
the 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 fourth century AD. But and Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were both produced after that because they are from late fourth century. So both of them do not have that. So someone inserted that passage later on into the Bible. Uh -huh. Secondly, uh, I think this would be too scholarly for her. I don't know what kind of how she goes about. But one thing you should know, these Christians, Christian apologists have invented a lot of answers for all of these things. Uh -huh. So if a person is not rational, he would always accept something that the Christian apologist says. Uh -huh. And the next thing it was, the next thing that was there was, uh, uh, would be the Old Testament. Like one question that I would ask anyone about it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like if, if Hebrew language was not there, let's say, when did he Hebrew language originate? And now this question concerns the Old Testament, not the uh -huh. New Testament, especially right. the first five books of the Old Testament that are combined combined known as Torah. So these books were written in, in Hebrew. They are attributed to Moses, that Moses was the one who wrote these five books. And he gave it, gave these books to Yahshua. And Yahshua placed all of these five books into the Ark of Covenant, along with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. So this is, this is what they believe. And according to Christians, According to Christians or the Jews, Moses most probably existed sometime between 1400 to 1600 BC. Oh. So now we want to know that would Moses have been able to write these five first books in Hebrew in 1600, uh, between 1600 and 1400 BC? Oh. The, there is no chance of that because the Hebrew language, the Proto-Hebrew only starts to develop after 1000 BC. Uh -huh. So there are some way, some way, some places where they have found some inscriptions that the Jewish or the Christians claim that they are written in Hebrew, but those are not Hebrew, those are Canaanite language. So in 1600 and between 1600 and 1400 BC, the people who lived in, in Judea or anyone who lived in Egypt, none of them spoke Hebrew. No one wrote Hebrew. So the first written evidence of Hebrew is found somewhere between 800 to 600 BC and most of the Old Testament including the Torah might have been written between 7th century BC and 2nd century BC. We don't know which part was written when but we knew that Hebrew was not present at that time. So this is the linguistic argument against the Old Testament uh -huh. but there is a linguistic argument against the New Testament as well. Uh -huh. Why? Because Jesus and his disciples did not speak Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. It was not written in, in Aramaic. Jesus most probably spoke Aramaic. Some people claim that he might have known Greek as well, but because he preached only in Judea, so he even if he knew Greek, he wouldn't be preaching in Greek. He would be only preaching in Aramaic. Uh -huh. So all these gospels and all the letters and the book of revelation all the 27 books of the new testament all of them were written in greek none of them were written in hebrew so if jesus spoke jesus preached in he in, 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 sorry uh, I, I i had to say uh, aramaic so if oh. jesus spoke aramaic if jesus spoke aramaic and, and he preached to people who spoke aramaic uh -huh. How can his disciples write in Greek? And a scribe of Greek, a person who can write a book in Greek at that time in Judea, there would be hardly people, there wouldn't be even 100 people in Judea who would be able to write a whole book in Greek. Uh -huh. So Josephus in his own biography writes 
that he knows two or three other people who know how to write in greek right and he went to through a lot of pain josephus was a jewish historian who wrote the history of jews for the for the for the uh, for the romans mm-hmm. uh, they were uh, and he wrote it in in uh, so uh, he learned greek because at that time he learned greek and he hardly knew two or three other uh, uh, jewish people who knew greek so uh, if we talk about who would be the people who knew greek in the first century ad so most of them would be either greeks or mm-hmm. either some hellenized jews who would have even you know their first language as greek so anyone who was living in judea at that time i don't believe that that person might have written the gospels and all of these four gospels mm-hmm. started to appear towards the end of the first century ad and oh. most of them uh, all of them were anonymous there was no matthew mark luke and john written on these books at all and the first gospel is the gospel of mark and the gospel of mark just abruptly ends in in uh, in there and what it says in the end was that the woman go to the tomb of christ where he was buried and they find the grave empty and there was a man standing there who tells them that jesus has risen and he's going to galilee and he would meet his disciples in galilee and this is where the gospel just ends and all the other verses the later verses in the gospel of uh, mark mm-hmm. were inserted at a much later point maybe somewhere in the 3rd century and the other gospels the the two other gospels matthew and luke heavily mm-hmm. copy from the gospel of mark and the gospel of john also copies from the other three gospels so there are a lot of things but i think you asked me for three and i told you this yeah i'm i'm also thinking of uh, arguing with her because it's not her she's just on the face there is an entire church behind it and uh, i argued early on about the the theory of evolution and mm. um she kind of got defeated and she said well i believe in evolution too so with the timeline you know I, i'm not so clear it seemed like about 6000 years ago that christianity believes that the world was created is that is that correct statement that they they think it was created some 6000 years ago uh can you come again sorry i was watching the chat uh, oh i'm uh, sorry there is something stupid going on in the chat and if this guy does not know how to stay in his pants i think you guys should you know uh, you should block him why didn't you block this guy yeah 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 mo yeah please well, please yeah, yeah no I, i was i was i was saying about the evolution and the way um she's just on the face the entire church is behind it mm-hmm. and um what they're telling me you know so i i told her and i argued her logically obviously no fighting here logically mm-hmm. i argued about the evolution and i mm-hmm. and i to, and i showed them everything how it's evident and it's it's a abundant of abundance of evidence you know the proof of burden mm-hmm. lies on them now not on me mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. but um some somewhere i i understood that they were talking about six um six uh, millenniums ago 6000 years ago that when world was created or something like that okay so, so they uh, are they are hardline creationists all all of them <laughs> yeah. and i'm telling them you know we like early today you 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 showed something about a a bacteria or, or organism 24000 years old yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. so there's so many uh, so that abundant... bacteria is older than all of their books religious books combined you know <laughs> yeah but yeah. but you know then they come back with an argument and i'm sure they're going to come back too because a lot of other people had similar people had done the similar thing which is uh, they question the carbon dating and the radio dating and all those procedures without actually understanding the would science. that would that woman want to talk with me um her you english is her. yeah no yeah. I, i can i can definitely bring her over she speaks yeah. spanish she speaks limited english i think the okay. pastor pastor speaks yeah. english 
better English. So I can always be translator for you and her. Uh, I would like to ask her if she can come next weekend, next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, definitely she can. She can. And you, if you want to bring the pastor, that would be a double treat, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I'll sure try. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because, you know, uh, in my opinion, Christians are more anti-science than Muslims. Yeah. This is this yeah. is this is this is uh, you know a person like you would know and I I also know that Christians are much more anti-science than Muslims because Muslims don't know science they don't they don't even uh, you know study science in schools they are just you know uh, ratifying it they are just learning it by heart and they are just writing it on the paper their papers they don't understand it. But yeah. all these objections that come against evolution, and even a Muslim is quoting these uh, objections, all of them come from these evangelical Christians. The guys like Cam Ken Ham, that you know, that uh, that uh, Noah theme park guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are the people who have invented all of these arguments, and Muslims are just blindly copying those arguments. There's nothing yeah. there. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. Um, one of the thing that came up. And she asked me, or basically the pastor behind her asked me that how would I like to get buried? And I said, I would like to donate my body towards science. And whatever is left, I would like to be cremated because that's the cheapest form of disposing my body at that time. Mm -hmm. So I uh, just want to see what, what are your thoughts? I know it's kind of a little personal sometimes. But I just want to ask you, what are your thoughts about either burial or cremation or some other way? I wouldn't want to be buried. I wouldn't want to be cremated. I think there is one option that is growing now. Mm -hmm. That is composting your body. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Because we always took away a lot from, you know, the environment. And if we bury ourselves six feet underground, we are not contributing anything back to the environment. So mm -hmm. if we compost a body and we make this natural fertilizer that can be given back to the plants and then plants can contribute it back to the environment, I think that would be the best thing that could happen with my body. I, would, I wouldn't want to be cremated. I don't know how expensive it is. And I think I hope by the time, I don't know when I will die, but uh, by the time I'm dead, it is one of the more readily available options. I would definitely want to get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, that was like one of those questions like um, they were trying to gauge me about and they also talk about black magic and voodoo and, you know, and I know where well, where <laughs> that lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I need some strong argument against voodoo and black magic as well. So uh, maybe next time. No, but can... they should give us some evidence that there is black magic, you know. We don't have any evidence. Well, none at all. Yeah. No, yeah. there is none. And even the people who actually perform the claim. Because these evangelical Christians, all of their uh, ministry depends upon the evil spirits. If they would say someone arguing with a Christian, they would say that guy is possessed by an evil spirit. So no matter where these evangelical Christians are, they, they don't see people. They always see evil spirits. So a pastor would abuse someone, they would sexually offend someone, they would molest a child, and they would also blame it on the evil spirits that made him do that, just like the mullahs. And maybe you live in USA, you would have seen something like that or heard of something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. Well, so thank you so much, sir. I got a lot yeah, thank of you. more questions. You I know. Next <laughs> time, just gave, definitely. Yeah. I just gave it the very end. So sorry about that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tiwari, okay. Amir Tiwari. Thank you so much okay. for being thank there. Thank you. Well. Thank you. See you. Okay. See you. Thank, okay. you. Okay. thank you. Okay. So guys, this is it. We are going to end here. So Amit's channel is there. And uh, yeah, whenever I try to find Amit's channel, this other Amit Tiwari just it's comes on. on your featured channel yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. So I am going to go to my featured channel list and I'm going to you know, show you his show you his channel. So this is his channel here. Uh, Basically, by all all thanks to that Amit Tiwari also, no? Because <laughs> okay, he has been okay. abused a lot. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is his channel, Amit's channel, and I'm going to just 
put it here in the chat as well so you guys go and subscribe to him and hopefully he's he's doing live streams he did not do it this week i think but in uh, the in from this next week, week i'll start week, yeah he, he's going to start once again and you know you can see all these other channels here as well haris is there and uh, yeah these science journey is also there i and darshil bharat is there uh, but i did not put science journey's channel into my featured channels that i'm going to put here so these are amit's featured channels so uh, i'm going to put all of these other channels that i think are aligned with our world view i'm going to put them into my own uh, there as well so you can see amit here amadadi is also there guzar bhai is there sultan's channel is there on my channel <laughs> no i did not add it till now but i'll do it yeah i i did so sultan's channel is also there uh, so guys do watch out these channels and hopefully you are going to like the content that they are creating aziz morani is saying bye <clears throat> bye you all thanks for Gal uh, thanks to galib for his time so guys uh, you can support me on patreon if you haven't subscribed to this channel do subscribe give this video a like before you go because you know when you give likes to this video then youtube thinks that i'm uh, doing good uh, doing a good job and it will suggest more people my content and hopefully you would see it and uh, keep a watch out for my science channel i am going to launch it very soon i have worked on 3 4 videos already and i am going to bringing be bringing it and it's going to be in english as well so you guys are going to like it so amit you want to say anything in the end nahi theek hai galib bhai okay okay then guys good then. it's good night from us we'll just sign out see you soon uh, see you next week on the same time same time and same channel good bye night bye. everyone good night good night